Sometime around 2007 or 2008, when I was in middle school, I came across a little web series called Making Fiends, which at the time was being hosted on the TurboNick website. I binged watched the entire series in a day or two, and then sometime later, the web series was turned into an actual TV show. Six episodes were released, and, as far as I can remember, I binged watched them on the TurboNick website as well. I thought to myself, wow, that was fun. I can't wait for more episodes to come out. And then all of a sudden it was 2023 and this video popped up in my recommendations. And a wave of nostalgia flooded over me. I never really forgot Making Fiends. It just sort of made its home in the back of my mind. Always there, always present, even if I wasn't aware of it. I remembered the characters' names and voices. Hi, Vendetta. I remembered certain plot points for both the show and the original web series. I could belt out the theme song or the vegetable song at the drop of a hat. Eat vegetables with every meal, all your years will start to feel. But I never really gave the show a lot of thought. And honestly, that's probably because there's not a lot to remind me of it. I never see anyone ever bring up Making Fiends. I used to watch a lot of animation review channels in my teens and no one ever mentioned Making Fiends. No Buzzfeed articles or whatever like, oh, do you remember this show from your childhood? No one ever talked about, oh, this one character was my favorite when I was a kid or this episode scared me. <laughs> this thumbnail was the first time I have ever seen anyone reference Making Fiends since around 2008, and it set me down an entire rabbit hole. As it turns out, Making Fiends is actually known in animation circles, and it's remembered for one specific reason, and one specific reason alone. Also, I did watch the video, and it's very good, you should watch it. But if we're going to talk about this show, and I mean really talk about this show, then we can't just start at the show. We can't even just start at the web series. No, if we're going to see the whole picture of what Making Fiends really was and what happened to it, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Amy Winfrey got her start in animation while studying at UCLA in the 1990s. She took an animation class for fun, found that she loved it, and then focused all of her studies on it. Her first job in the industry was as an animator for South Park, which she worked alongside fellow UCLA students Peter Merriman, Morton Sandranda, and Aglaya Morchiva. At the time, it was being made in the same neighborhood as their school, and they had put some flyers up around campus looking for animators. Winfrey was primarily responsible for the lip syncing for the first 15 episodes. She also took a break from school to work on the feature length South Park movie, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, which came out in 1999. Also in 1999, Winfrey made a short film called The Bad Plant, which she actually uploaded to her YouTube account while I was writing the script. It's a CG animated short, narrated by Merriman, about a woman, voiced by Alyssa Calfin, who lives with a cow and plant named Bill. Bill has a lot of big dreams and wants to escape the house and starts to act out while waiting for his chance. The woman thinks that Bill is trying to kill her and hires a guy to kill him first, but before he can, Bill blasts off to space. The woman and the cow patch up the house and get a new plant. The end. This is a very cute short, but it also has an eerie feel to it, with the dread of Bill potentially planning something bad looming over you the whole time, amplified by the dark lighting and the ticking clock in the background. She rearranged the silverware and modified the easy chair. The whole thing is told in rhyme, too, so it comes off like a twisted Dr. Seuss story. I'm through with being nice to Bill. I do believe he means me ill. Winfrey tied for a silver medal for this short at the 2000 Student Academy Awards, and an up-and-coming composer known as Ego Plum, who was in attendance, liked her work so much that he approached her and gave her his first album, which he described as music for non-existent cartoons. While at UCLA, Winfrey also created a website dedicated to the preservation of traffic cones for a class. The site ended up getting a surprising amount of attention, and this inspired Winfrey to create a series of animated shorts for her thesis project, known as Muffin Films, 
all 12 revolve around, well, muffins, and each utilize a different method of flash animation. In my opinion, these films are all pretty cute. The art's cute, the voices are cute. Why don't you like us too? Why don't you like us too? Oh, so we a Most of the voices are done by Winfrey herself, but some are voiced by someone credited as PM, or PM Squared, who I would assume is Merriman. But I don't want to be eaten. But some of them are pretty much just cute without anything else going on, and others contain dark elements. <coughs> Sometimes the muffins want to be eaten and pressure people to do it. Come on, try us! Sometimes they don't want to be eaten and come back as vengeful spirits to enact their revenge. And old man muffin did him in. Sometimes people eat too many muffins, out of greed or out of being forced to, and they die as a result. One more bite and I'd explode! Hmm? No! There's one where a child is implied to be murdered. Fun times all around! These were uploaded to the internet in the year 2000 on MuffinFilms.com, but Winfrey also uploaded them onto a site called Nibblebox which was dedicated to showing off the creative talents of students and recent graduates. And it wasn't just somewhere to upload existing works, it also had original programming. The site worked with students to create a series of shorts, with the pay limited to no more than 2000 per short, and the creators having to sign away some of their distribution rights. However, working with Nibblebox came with some benefits too, such as access to equipment and a mentoring program where students and graduates would be paired with someone with experience in the industry to help them with their projects. Amy Winfrey's Muffin Films was one of the first eight series of sorts, or nibbles? Apparently they called their sorts nibbles. I'm not going to do that. They were one of the first eight sorts on the website, and they overall had a very positive reception and gained Winfrey a solid online following. So in 2001, when it came to making a second round of shorts to upload to the site, Winfrey was paired up with Ariel Tepper, who seems to be a Broadway producer, to create a series known as Big Bunny. Big Bunny. Big Bunny, a special bunny friend. Big Bunny is about three little kids who go into the woods to look for their missing dog, named Muffin. <coughs> probably as a reference to Muffin films. Mmm, Muffin. And while they don't find their dog, they do find a giant pink rabbit who wants to eat them. Do not run, tasty children. Once again, most of the voices are done by Winfrey. Oh boy. It's a soft. Hey, this isn't a couch. Except for Big Bunny, who is voiced by Merriman. The boy and girl have grown large ears. Every episode has Big Bunny telling the kids a story that he probably shouldn't be telling them. He ground up the remains and baked a big red pie. I don't think that story was appropriate for us. It was kind of violent. And then before the kids go home, the big bunny tells them to eat something fattening. Make sure to drink plenty of milkshakes and eat lots of sausage. Eat plenty of French fries with mayonnaise. Eat lots of gouda. Eat lots of candy and egg yolks. And then the show itself ends with the bunny taking two of the kids away with him as he searches for a new home. I'm sure they're going to live a very nice life together. Well, eat lots of carrots, dumb bunny. A lot of people seem pretty nostalgic for the short, and it overall seems to be pretty well loved when it was initially uploaded. It was even featured in the 2007 novel, Later Gator. The book is all in instant messages, and the characters talk about and reference Big Bunny. Amy Winfrey seemed to have given permission for Big Bunny to be included in the book, and from what I've seen, she seems excited that it was included. However, Big Bunny was originally created as a Nibblebox program, and in 2001, Nibblebox was acquired by and merged with Hypnotic, and Hypnotic had no interest in continuing with Big Bunny. Winfrey was planning on making 10 episodes, but Hypnotic stopped her when she had only made 6. 
Fortunately, C managed to convince them to let her make one more episode to give the series a conclusion. They also apparently let her make a pilot to turn Big Bunny into a television series. The pilot is much longer than a typical Big Bunny episode and is actually kind of a mashup of three different episodes with a longer opening and new animation. The pilot was never picked up, however, and even if Winfrey wanted to keep making episodes of Big Bunny on her own, she couldn't. She didn't own the rights to Big Bunny. Hypnotic did. They ended the series and left Winfrey, as well as all the other creators Nibblebox had brought on board, in the dust. Shocked and upset by the ordeal, Winfrey decided to create a new web series, one that she could keep independent for as long as possible, that she could do with what she pleased, and could make as many episodes as she wanted. And that, of course, finally takes us to... Making fiends, making fiends, Renetta's always making fiends, making fiends while Charlotte makes friends. Originally created in 2003, the series focuses on two little girls, Vendetta, an evil green girl who creates monsters to torment the town, and Charlotte, a cheerful blue girl who wants to be Vendetta's friend and genuinely does not seem to notice how evil she is. She's so mysterious, but nice. I think we are going to be the best of friends. Vendetta is, of course, very annoyed that someone in town is not afraid of her, and tries over and over again to kill Charlotte, which always fails. <coughs> Amy Winfrey is the creator and main director, and she also does the bulk of the animation, although not all of it. Merriman is credited in quite a few episodes, and towards the end, there's a bunch of new people. I couldn't find information on everyone credited, but we have Martin Sandreda, who worked with Winfrey and Merriman on South Park, and Neil Ishimine primarily works in games, but also worked on South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Also, Chris Freya, who was a technical producer on South Park, did some voice work on some of the fiends. In terms of the voice cast, Amy Winfrey voices nearly all the female characters, while Peter Merriman voices the male characters. And also Mrs. Minty. Uh, no. I don't think so. Mary Min has been part of Winfrey's work from the beginning, and at some point he and Winfrey actually got married. I'm not sure what point that is, but from now on I'm just gonna refer to him as her husband. Then there's Vendetta. What? What are you doing? As a kid, I just thought that the same person who did Charlotte and the rest of the female characters' voices voiced Vendetta, and she was just doing an accent. Because, like, y you know, Vendetta is evil, and evil characters often have accents. Or sometimes not even evil ones, like genius ones, too. With my cloning machine, I can duplicate my brilliant self any number of times. But no, Vendetta is voiced by Aglaya Morchiba, who, if you remember, went to school with and worked on South Park alongside Winfrey and Merriman. She's actually Bulgarian. I always imagine her angry and uh, probably my own frustration sometimes comes through. Aside from voice acting and animating, she's also an illustrator. The Fiends are Winfrey's creations, she's been drawing them since at least college, but Morchiba did seem to have a hand in the design. Granted, all the information I could find on this was for the TV show, but Winfrey would apparently sketch out her ideas and then hand them over to Morchiba to clean them up and draw them in a way that would be easy to animate. The art direction here is pretty interesting. Probably the most obvious thing about it is that the characters are all one color. Their skin, eyes, hair, clothes. Some of the fiends and animals break this rule, but all the humans look like this. It's funny, watching Big Bunny, it actually becomes pretty clear that the art style for making fiends is just Winfrey's normal style, but simplified a lot. I mean, Big Bunny tells a story about a girl named Susie, and she looks exactly like Vendetta. Despite the simplicity, though, it's honestly kind of impressive how expressive the characters are. Vendetta especially, when she gets annoyed or angry, she squints her eyes. Which is a small thing, but it adds so much personality. Same idea, too, with Mr. Milk's hair flying up when he's scared. Vendetta's mouth is also more round than the other characters. Everyone else's mouth is drawn more rectangular. 
Charlotte's mouth is also always shaped like a smile, even when she's making a surprise O face, it's always vaguely smiley shaped. The fact that there's an episode where Charlotte dresses up like Vendetta, and they're like pretty much identical, but it's still easy to tell who is who because of the facial expressions, is honestly kind of impressive. These aren't just circles with faces, the way that they're drawn is extremely reflective of their personalities. I also like this subtle thing that they do to make the characters look just like mildly kind of concerned, where the eyes get less round at the top. I would imagine that the decisions regarding this art style were made to keep the characters as simple as possible in order to save on bandwidth. Like, Nibblebox's whole model revolved around not worrying about bandwidth, but if you're a smaller creator paying for your own website, that is a much larger concern, which is also why the backgrounds are pretty sparse. There are some fun background details, don't get me wrong. A is for alimony, a reference to muffin films, dead cat. That Vendetta's house is just full of framed pictures of herself always makes me laugh. I don't know why. <laughs> In the first episode, Grudge cuts the swings with a pair of scissors. Mm. And in the next episode, you can see Notch from where the swing was tied back on, which honestly shows an impressive attention to detail and a care for continuity. Still, there isn't really a lot to look at here. Everything's just kind of made of gray blobs, and even the character designs are kind of messy with the color going outside the lines. But it all kind of adds up to create an atmosphere. The simplicity and scribbling coloration make them look like something a child might draw. And honestly, the background buildings kind of resemble something made out of construction paper. Even the texture looks a little bit like construction paper. Not to mention that the emptiness and monotone coloring of the background makes the whole thing feel appropriately gloomy. The town is in ruins from Vendetta and her fiends, and the survivors are living in the rubble. There's no one around to help, no hope at all, and you pick up on that immediately just by looking at it. The characters all being one solid color against the darker gray textured background make them stand out, and Charlotte, Vendetta, and Vendetta's giant hamster grudge especially stand out, since they are much more saturated than the other characters. There's not really a lot of background music either, which adds to the eerie atmosphere. Aside from a few dramatic moments here and there, the only times we really get music is when a character is singing. And usually Charlotte is the one singing. Monkeys live up in trees, monkeys have furry knees. Her songs all have pretty basic little jiggles playing behind them. Number two pencil, you're my pointy friend. Number two pencil, I love you till the end. Or sometimes no music at all. Eat vegetables with every meal, or your lips will start to peel. But again, it adds to this weird atmosphere the whole series has, especially since the songs are typically framed as being annoying. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. That was very interesting. Like, I don't personally think they're annoying, they're honestly pretty cute and catchy, but within the actual story, her singing usually annoys the other characters. And by other characters, I mean Vendetta. It is fun to pet your kitty nose. My hamster doesn't like singing! Vendetta is pretty antisocial. She doesn't have any friends, and she doesn't appear to want any. She likes peace and quiet, and to be left alone. She's disgusted by affection of all kinds, and openly rejects it when it's shown to her. You're so bright and fuzzy and buoyant, just like a little duck. Ah! Get away from me! And by taking over the town, she's essentially made it so that she could be left alone to whittle away at her hobbies, read magazines, have recess whenever she wants. Isn't it time for recess? Oh, oh, oh yes. And Dana, uh, of, of course. And eat her favorite food every day. Why is it all? Question not thine clams, nor thine jerked beef. These be favorite foods of yon fiend maker. There's honestly something very endearing about a child taking over an entire town and using that power to make it so that the school cafeteria only serves her favorite food. And so is the whole idea of a girl making her pet hamster into a giant buff bodyguard in order to protect her. 
Granted, I don't think it's ever stated that Grudge was ever actually her pet, but in the very last episode of the web series, Vendetta makes a mixture to dip Charlotte's pet hamster in to turn it into a feed. Just one dip in this, and her hamster will become a hideous fiend! <laughs> so, like... And while the whole town does eventually get destroyed by said fiend mix, causing the survivors to escape on a boat and live at sea, it wasn't Vendetta who did it. Charlotte did. It was an accident. But this does go to show just how easily Vendetta could have completely destroyed the town if she wanted to. But she didn't. She got it to a state that she liked, and she left it like that. So, her main motivation here wasn't pure destruction, it was to create a town that suited her needs. And there's something very relatable about wanting to create a world where you don't have to have any social interactions, or even leave the house if you don't feel like it. But the thing that makes Vendetta a villain is the way that she achieves this perfect world is by wrecking another. Vendetta totally kills people, like, it's never shown or discussed, despite it being her clear intention at many, many points. She threatens death on everything and everyone. Come to Charlotte's birthday party or you will be shot. There are empty chairs in this classroom, and the kids are absolutely terrified of her. Which isn't really too unusual for a school bully, but it is telling that the adults are scared of her too. We see this the most with her teacher, Mr. Milk. No. You, you can't sit there. Huh? That's, that's her chair. Oh. Who is a quivering, stuttering mess who is constantly being bullied by this red bird feed Vendetta has following him around and who bends to every single demand Vendetta makes of him, even asking her permission before he tries to teach the class. I, I thought we'd read a story. M maybe? As cute as it is that she wants to eat her favorite foods every day, she makes everyone else eat them too, and she enforces this by threatening and terrorizing the lunch lady. In the episode Mrs. Minty, Mr. Milk is out sick and a substitute named Mrs. Minty comes to class and actually wants to teach them stuff. We'll be studying the moth and its life cycle. Vendetta is so appalled by this that she storms out and makes two giant feeds who drag Mrs. Minty away. Goodbye, children, goodbye, my little marshmallow. Never to be seen again until the last second at the end of the web series. So at least we know she isn't dead. We also see in this episode that Mr. Milk is just so terrified of Vendetta that he comes back to the school to teach despite clearly suffering from a horrible illness. Thank you for finding me, Vendetta. I, I am feeling a lot better. And it's not as if Vendetta is hurting people incidentally. No, the pain is the point. She likes the power. She likes it when people cower under her. The reason Mrs. Minty was punished wasn't because she wanted to teach the kids about moths or whatever. It was because she refused to be intimidated by Vendetta. Now really, my lemon drops, you can't bring animals to school. Ow! Ow! The tricks Vendetta used to terrorize Mr. Milk did not work on Mrs. Minty. Isn't it time for recess? Oh no, little buttercup. Recess isn't for another hour and a half. What? And she treated Vendetta just like every other student. And don't forget, my little duckling. You must raise your hand before speaking. Stripping away all power Vendetta had in the classroom, and thus, Vendetta had to publicly drag her away in order to reassert herself as the one who was truly in charge. Goodbye, my stupid clam cake. In wintry day, Vendetta decides to stay home from school, and as a result, Mr. Milk and the other students are able to be carefree and happy for the first time in years. When Vendetta finds out about this, she promises to come down to the school to punish them. And she's coming to school right now! And she says she can't wait to really make us sing! And sends some snowflake feeds to terrorize them in the meantime. <laughs> and the episode ends with her evil laughter over the credits. <laughs> this asserts Vendetta's motivations loud and clear. She isn't just doing what she does because she wants peace and quiet. She could literally just stay home and not worry about what the other kids do if that was her goal. No, 
She wants everyone in this town to be miserable and terrified every second. And if they're too happy while she's away, well, she'll just have to go there to re-traumatize them herself. This episode shows that the reason Vendetta continues to go to school is because she wants to ensure that the other students and faculty at the school are miserable, and that she sends something as nice and peaceful as the first snowfall of the year to surround the happy teacher and students only for it to turn out to be a deadly trap, truly gets across that they aren't allowed to enjoy anything. That anything and everything could be one of her feeds ready to attack, and she can't let them have a moment of peace even one time in their miserable lives. On top of that, Vendetta doesn't really treat her feeds that well. Her feeds are basically just monsters that she creates in her kitchen like she's making brownies or something, and she uses them to assert her control over the town. Evil as she might be, she's still just a child. She doesn't have the physical strength to actually hurt or even intimidate anyone, or at least the adults who are scared of her, and we never really see her attack anyone herself. She throws stuff at Charlotte sometimes. It's a pretty rock with pretty speckles. Vendetta gave it to me. I threw it at you. Ooh, thanks, Vendetta. And we do see her grab a few people's shirts and steal Marvin's lunch. My clubs. But that's kind of it. Her fiends do pretty much everything else. And maybe that is kind of her downfall in a way. She probably doesn't need her fiends to kill Charlotte. Like, her most successful plan by far was the one where she tricked Charlotte into walking off the pier in concrete shoes. <laughs> that totally would have worked if it wasn't for the fact that Charlotte could hold her breath for nine hours. <gasps> But no, pretty much every single plan she conjures up has her creating a fiend to go kill Charlotte. Sometimes the fiends are absolutely horrifying, and Charlotte only escapes from dumb luck. Why don't you put this hat on? Oh, but then you wouldn't be able to see the special birthday ribbons in my hair. What? Here, have a party hat. Hey. Ow. Ah. But also, sometimes the fiends are just poorly designed. My arms are short. My legs are long. This predates Meet the Robinsons by a good few years, by the way. <laughs> but sometimes, the feeds end up befriending Charlotte. <laughs> You're cute. Would you like a sugar cookie? No! We see this the most clearly with the little scissor bird fiend, known as Buttons 2 in the TV series. Vendetta makes him specifically to cut off Charlotte's limbs. You have all your limbs! But he ends up befriending her instead. And when Vendetta questions this, Charlotte just says that she gave him lots of love. I gave him lots of love. She also gives him paper to cut and other things to do to stimulate his need for fiendery, which is just good pet care in general. She also wins over the giant cat just by taking care of it, which is something probably no one's done before. Granted, she does lose favor with him by trying to give him a bath. Bath! 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 <coughs> but the cat does save Charlotte in a few different instances, so like... Maybe it still likes her in some way? She also immediately befriends Janet the giant squid, who... might be a feed? Or just a giant squid, I'm not really sure. Grudge is really the only feed that we've seen stay purely loyal to Vendetta over the course of multiple episodes, and he does seem to really care about her but Vendetta doesn't treat him kindly at all. She never even calls him by his actual name, instead just calling him Hamster or Stupid Hamster. No! Those are scissors, you stupid hamster! And he's the one who does most of the intimidating. <clears throat> Vendetta has this huge, scary brute following her around to frighten anyone who doesn't bend to her will, and this is most of the reason she has the hold over the townspeople that she does. Yet, she doesn't respect him, and the second he starts to annoy her, she dumps him. In the episode Rubella, Charlotte gives Vendetta a musical greeting card, and since Vendetta hates music, Grudge eats it in an attempt to get rid of it. Unfortunately, <laughs> the card just continues to play in his stomach, and this infuriates <gasps> Vendetta it. so much that she kicks him out and replaces him with a new fiend named Rubella. 
Boo Bella. Who was voiced by Alyssa Kelfin from The Bad Plant. <laughs> and this very clearly breaks Grudge's giant hamster heart. He continues to show up to the school and wait near her house, even though she doesn't want him anymore. However, a little bit of Charlotte's kindness has also infected Rubella. Charlotte asks Rubella if she wants to be friends when they first meet. Let's be friends! Friend! And then in Concrete Shoes, Rubella has decided that she and Vendetta are friends. Rubella, friend? Sure, whatever. And gives her a musical toy, which obviously Vendetta hates, so she immediately dumps Rubella. Grudge helps her, and Vendetta initially takes him back. Look how happy he is by her just showing him the smallest bit of affection. Oh my god. But then, when both the card and the toy start playing in his stomach, she Never dumps mind. him again. Don't follow me! As it turns out, she can't make anything big without help, so she resorts to making the feed dip. And yeah, we know how that turns out. <laughs> Grudge runs in to shield Vendetta with his own body, and she's genuinely touched by this, finally admitting in her own way that she appreciates him. Perhaps you are a good hamster after all. It's nice that the series ended with Vendetta kind of, sort of, accepting a genuine friend into her life. Granted, she doesn't, like, apologize or promise to treat him any better or anything like that. But, I mean, baby steps, I guess. <coughs> but, this is the only fiend that she's done that to. Rubella got screwed. She's not even on the boat at the end, so she's probably just dead. Vendetta only views her fiends by their utility a tool for her to wreak chaos. She barely acknowledges them as autonomous beings. Charlotte, by contrast, sees them as potential friends. Or, at the very least, pets. Oh, a puppy! I've always wanted a puppy! But despite Charlotte's more kindly approach to them, she is also responsible for a lot of feed deaths. Here, have a kebab! <laughs> Not on purpose, of course but she never actually notices what she's done. And sometimes, when it isn't her fault, Charlotte will still watch a fiend die a slow, horrible, painful death and go, Oh wow, where'd this chocolate lake come from? And then she sings a song about sailing in the dead fiend's chocolate blood. Imagine in the chocolate lake a boat with candy sails. Charlotte is a force of pure positivity. She's always laughing and smiling and singing, but this is also just because she's extraordinarily naive, like to an absolutely absurd degree. Come on, Buttons. Shake hands with the kitty. Shake, shake. She literally watches atrocity after atrocity happen right in front of her, and she still thinks everything is all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> We didn't have giant cats at my old school. She never shows any sadness or discomfort in the entire web series, aside from a little bit of confusion when she first arrives. Today is my first day at the school. I'm from Vermont. And no matter what she witnesses, no matter what everyone around her tells her, including Vendetta herself, Stay away from my fins! Okay. Would you and your hamster and your giant kitty like to come over and play after school? She always thinks that Vendetta is the nicest person in the school and also her best friend. But Vendetta, you don't need to be any bigger. You already have the biggest heart. Charlotte is a subversion of a Pollyanna-like character. Pollyanna is a 1913 novel later adapted into a 1960s Disney film about an extremely optimistic little girl that makes everyone's life better. The obvious takeaway that most people have from this movie, at least as far as I've witnessed, is that having a positive outlook is infectious. That being happy and chipper, even during the worst times of your life, is the only way to get by, and will even inspire everyone around you to be happy and positive too. Pollyanna is, in recent years, used as an insult. I remember seeing boomers call each other that after the 2016 election. Sometimes the world really is that bad, 
And sometimes you have to be sad and angry in order to want to do something about it. And someone telling you that everything will be fine as long as you stay happy can be really, really annoying. Charlotte does not improve anything with her positive attitude. Nothing ever gets better because she's around. She never cheers anyone up, never saves anyone, except for at the very end. These people aren't miserable for no reason. There's an evil villain literally torturing and traumatizing them every single day. Of course, standing around smiling when the villain runs around unchecked isn't going to solve anything. And not only does Charlotte not make things better for the townspeople, she also sometimes makes them actively worse. Wintry Day, on top of being an interesting look into Vendetta, is also the first hint that we get that Charlotte is kind of dangerous in her own right. About halfway through, while Mr. Milk and the other students are literally celebrating how they're free because Vendetta isn't there, Charlotte comments, I wish Vendetta could be here. And then vanishes for the rest of the episode, until suddenly reappearing at the very end to announce, Good news! I found Vendetta, and she's coming to school right now! And she says she can't wait to really make us sing. <laughs> she snitched on them. This is the first time, in fact, the only time, in the entire web series that Mr. Milk and the other children have been happy and relaxed. They're out here singing about how it's winter, but there's no snow and no Christmas, but it's still a nice day. There's no snow, but that's okay. What a wonderful winter day. Which is a clear parallel for them being stuck in a destroyed town full of monsters, but since Vendetta isn't here, they can finally have just one good day. And then the snow falls at the end of their song about how it doesn't feel like winter, and it's a sign of hope that maybe things are bad, but they can still feel normal for a little while. And Charlotte takes that from them. It's honestly such a gut punch when she shows up. You're just so mesmerized by these normally miserable characters being so joyous for once that you don't even notice that she's gone. And the second she mentions Vendetta's name, their smiles instantly vanish. Charlotte didn't do this to be cruel. She likes Vendetta, and she sees that everyone's having fun, and she wishes that Vendetta could be here to have fun too. This was in no way a malicious act. She just isn't capable of putting two and two together as to why everyone in town is so happy when Vendetta is away. But her not understanding that Vendetta is dangerous makes Charlotte dangerous too. I mean, Charlotte destroys the town. And yeah, you know, it was an accident. Charlotte mistook Vendetta's feed dip as green paint, and she put it in a bucket and painted a statue. She made a Vendetta with it, but then it brought the statue, the bucket, and the paintbrush to life. The bucket and paintbrush then proceeded to paint all the buildings in the town, which brought them to life too. Charlotte had no way of knowing that that would happen, but she did go into the house of the girl who she knows creates monsters, and took something from her kitchen. No one else in the town would have ever done that. And even if they were friends, and even if that was just paint, it's still not acceptable to go into someone's house without permission and take their stuff. And yeah, the latter half of this episode is all about Vendetta getting karmic punishment. She was about to use this dip to mutilate someone else's pet, but now it's bringing stuff to life that is attacking her for once. One, literally being a giant statue of herself. Statues are usually created to show respect to a leader or a powerful person. And the others being the literal town that she destroyed and enslaved. So the entire town, as well as the symbol for Vendetta's power, are now, ironically, the things that are taking her down. And then she ends up stuck on a boat with Charlotte for months and months. Something that the episode shows to be Vendetta's personal hell. Is this to be my torment? My torment for all eternity! It's good that Vendetta doesn't win in the end, but Charlotte is also punishing everyone else in the town who are completely innocent. They just lost everything too, and they're stuck with Vendetta, 
who they have all been shown to be absolutely terrified of. Except for Mrs. Minty. But who knows, maybe she is now after the pencil incident. And that's how the web series ends. Despite there literally being an evil mastermind character who likes to destroy stuff, it ends up being the sweet, cheerful little optimist who destroys the town. Everyone sails off into the sunset while Vendetta screams in agony and Charlotte sings about how happy she is that they're together. Oh, it doesn't matter just what we do. This was followed up by a Thanksgiving special that has Vendetta leave Charlotte on a small island that turns out to be a huge turkey that flings her back onto the boat. Hi, Vendetta. Ah! This is actually considered the 21st episode of Making Fiends, so I guess that this is actually the finale? Either way, these last two episodes came out in 2005. However, the process of turning the web series into a fully-fledged television show had started back in 2004. Apparently, an employee at Nickelodeon's Daughter was a fan of Making Fiends, and the employee showed it around the office. Winfrey was contacted about potentially bringing her series onto the network, and the negotiations began. During this time, Winfrey continued to make episodes of the web series and sell merch in her gift shop. She was getting a combined 20,000 hits per day on all of her websites and was doing well enough to live off of Making Fiends. In 2006, Nickelodeon started to distribute episodes of the web series, both on iTunes and on their then streaming site, TurboNick. TurboNick was basically a place to watch Nickelodeon videos and play games. And apparently, it also aired a few times on the Nickelodeon network, particularly after Chalk Zone and My Life as a Teenage Robot. And it did well! It got popular enough that in 2006, Nickelodeon greenlit the show, and production officially began in January of 2007, with the first episode premiering on October 4th, 2008. Making fiends, making fiends, Vendetta's always making fiends, making fiends while Charlotte makes friends. The show did have to be changed a little to make it more child-friendly. Winfrey even expresses in an interview that if she knew that the series would be picked up to be a kid's show, she might have not made it about a little girl trying to murder another little girl. Still, dark shows aren't exactly new to Nickelodeon. Invader Zib had an entire episode about stealing organs, after all. And Nickelodeon was apparently pretty chill about their weird, dark sense of humor. We're going to get more into this later, but they apparently allowed making feeds to get away with things that other shows weren't allowed to. Even so, there are definitely figs in the web series that would never make it to television. Come to Charlotte's birthday party or you will be shot. You could shoot it! We don't want a gun. The dead animals on the wall got removed, obviously, but Nickelodeon also did not like the A for alimony picture. Maybe they didn't want kids asking questions about it. So, A for abomination it is. There is this, frankly, out of character moment right before Charlotte and Vendetta fly a kite in a lightning storm. <laughs> where Charlotte, who is known to be extremely reckless and do extremely dangerous activities on the regular, basically looks right at the audience and says, Oh no, it's too dangerous to fly a kite in a lightning storm. But it's dangerous to fly a kite in a thunderstorm. You could get electrocuted. Which, if that doesn't scream studio interference, I don't know what does. The vegetable song also got censored, weirdly enough. The original version went, And your eyeballs will fall out. But when it got adapted to Nickelodeon, it was changed to... And your eyebrows will fall out. So, okay, I guess the idea of eyeballs falling out of your head is a little intense for kids. But also, like, don't Spongebob and Patrick take their eyes out, like, a lot? Why is it okay for Spongebob not to have eyes, but the singing vegetables can't even mention eyes falling out? Kinda weird. One nice thing about a creator getting to remake their show is that they get a chance to rework things. Like when Grudge cuts Charlotte Swig, in the original, Vendetta walks off and Charlotte is pretty much just listing stuff you could cut with scissors to herself. Ribbons? Cardboard? Coupons? Buttercups? 
Whereas in the TV series, Vendetta sticks around and reacts to what Charlotte is saying. He can cut paper too? No. Cardboard? No. Coupons? No. Beards? Buttercups? No. Which is not only funnier, because we now get Charlotte and Vendetta's contrasting personalities playing off of each other, but it's also a smoother transition to Charlotte talking about how nice Vendetta is. She's so mysterious, but nice. Since she's saying this right after a conversation with Vendetta, and not just after talking to herself. There are also a couple of small line changes here and there that honestly make the scenes way funnier than they were before. Dear Charlotte, that's me. Dear stupid girl, that's me. Not every change is strictly positive, though. Some are just weird. The song Charlotte sings on the swings in the first episode is different now. In the web series, she sings about the kitty. Kitty, kitty, where did you go? It is fun to pet your kitty Open. nose. Which makes sense because she just met the kitty. And the kitty comes back and trashes the playground in the next episode. So it's kind of foreshadowing, I guess. Yay, the kitty! Whereas in the TV show, she sings about going to the moon. Swing, 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 set, swing me to the moon. I can't breathe there, so bring me back real soon. For some reason. Please they have the exact same tune, know? too. It the words are just different. The show and tell section was changed a lot, too. In the web series, Marion shows off a glass figurine. Red. And that's why, this is my, my favorite glass animal. And then when Vendetta releases her fiend, it looks like a monkey, which Charlotte points out. It looks like a monkey! And then it steals the figurine and a bunch of bananas, and it chooses to eat the figurine over the bananas. Which is the joke, right? Like, haha, monkey doesn't like bananas, but it does like glass. In the show, though, Marvin's banana gets the focus during show and tell. We don't even see Mary in show and tell. And also, the fiend doesn't look like a monkey anymore. It's a tentacle monster now. Charlotte still calls it a monkey, though. You look like a monkey. So, I guess the joke now is that she's dumb. Which, I mean, yeah, fair. They do something similar with the banana, though, with Charlotte's rock replacing the glass horse. <laughs> So, I guess it's pretty much the same thing, although I do wonder why they completely changed the type of fiend. Maybe they wanted to clearly set up the fiends as dangerous earlier on, since the monkey didn't really attack anyone? I don't know. But honestly, Marvin's show and tell about his banana is funnier and more memorable than Marion's. And that's how this banana saved my life. So you know what, this is fine. No further questions. It is nice that the entire cast made the switch to television, though. Even Chris Freya. He literally comes back just to reprise his role as Carrot. Vegetables of every kind. What a legend. Interestingly enough, Charlotte's voice is different in the TV show, despite Winfrey still voicing her. It's slower now? And thank you for my new friend. Thank you so much for the new puppy, Vendetta. But also, it seems like Winfrey is just saying her lines in her normal voice, and then it gets pitch shifted later. But what about vegetables? Pah! What about them? They should be on the menu, too! But what about vegetables? Pah! What about them? They should be on the menu, too! Maybe talking in such a high-pitched voice was a strain on her. Who knows? Some of the animators came along, too. Namely Martin Sandrita and Eliza Cinciarini. Sandrina directed a lot of the TV episodes, and Cinciarini is credited as background cleanup. Of course, since this is a whole television production now, there are a lot more people working on it. One of the most notable ones is Dave Wasson, who served as supervising director and voices a bunch of minor characters. Oh, uh, uh hello, Mr. Milk. <laughs> Mr. Milk? Oh. <laughs> And Ego Plub was brought on to do the music. Winfrey remembered him after he gave her his first album at the film festival and asked him to make songs for the show. The show still doesn't have a lot of background music. There are a lot of scenes that have no music at all, but there's more than what was in the web series. 
and what was created for the show fits in perfectly well. I'm not good at talking about music, so I can't point to anything specific that makes it work, but I will say that the same weird, eerie vibes remain from the original. Most of the music Eagle Plum made is purposely very strange. He would use dripping water, toy pianos and toy xylophones, slide whistles, a goat, Apparently, he often purposely played out of tune to give what the website describes as an off-kilter, childlike quality. And he had the cast and crew join in with the instruments in order to make the music feel homemade. Which is fitting, because the series quite literally started off as being homemade. I also like how in the first episode, when Charlotte is exploring the town for the first time, the instrumental to Pretty Town, which is featured later on in a short, is playing. Pretty, pretty, pretty town full of pretty things. A pretty, pretty, pretty town full of birds that sing. Woo! What a pretty town! There are also a lot of new musical numbers in the show. Amy Winfrey has a talent for catchy little jingles, and she was still writing the songs for the show. She would record them to give to Ego Plum. Or sometimes she would just sing them over his answering machine, and Ego Plum would write the accompaniment. And honestly, every single one of these songs slaps. Cheese is better with your best friend. Cheddar's nicer when they are too. Cheese is best when you can share. Swizz is better with me and you. I love the pretending song. It gets stuck in my head constantly, mostly when I'm at work. Why don't we pretend to be telemarketers? Yippee! We can sell long distance plans and call and call and call. I love these subtle little jabs about how dumb and pointless all these jobs are. Let's pretend, let's pretend, pretend that this is fun. Why don't we pretend to be CEOs of companies? We can point at things on screens and work hard at racquetball. Winfrey's songwriting is honestly very clever, and I feel like that doesn't get enough credit. I lost it laughing when rewatching the web series as an adult, and Charlotte is singing this nonsense song about voting. Vote, vote, vote. Unless you are a donut, cause donuts don't vote. And then she just drops some social commentary on how terrible this country is. Unless you are a felon, cause felons can't vote. And even if the vegetable song did have to be changed so kids weren't traumatized or whatever, it still did get a few new verses, and they're honestly really great. Eat tiny bees. But never ever eat their shoes. Now that Making Fiends was going to television, the episodes would have to be expanded, since the webisodes were only about two to four minutes long. Not every episode got adapted, and there were plenty of new ones that were written specifically for the show, but the ones that did get carried over had to be changed quite a bit to fit the new format. The first and second episodes of the web series got crammed together to create the first episode of the TV series, and Scissor Feed and Shrinking Slug, now known as a fiendish friend and Shrinking Charlotte respectively, got new songs and extra scenes. Even the theme song got extended and changed. It adds a whole new verse and it's sung in a much more upbeat tone. Then there came another girl who wanted to be friends. And Etta cannot stand her, so she plots her end. It seems like they were trying to keep the sinister voice from the original web series in it for the TV show, since there are examples of them experimenting with it. Then there came another girl who wanted to be friends. But it just didn't work out. I like the new theme though. It's bouncy and fun and the visuals fit well. The visuals themselves have gone through some changes. With the character designs, there's no longer random scribbles outside of the lines. In fact, it now seems like there is an outline around the outline, which gives off the same effect, but in a much more clean, precise way. There is also a variety in line weight that didn't exist in the original web series. Basically, line weight refers to how thick or thin lines are. In the web series, the character's eyes and mouths were thicker than the rest of the body, probably in order to draw the eye right to the face, but the actual body itself had all the same line weight. However, now in the TV series, the outline around the outside of the body has a thicker line than the inside of the body. It's pretty clear when you look at Charlotte's hair. 
the outer outline of the hair is much thicker than the inner curl. And with the arms, the line on the outer arm is thicker than the line on the inner arm. Speaking of drawing the eye to the face, the eyes have actually been brightened by a few shades, so they stand out slightly from the rest of the body. The teeth, too, in the few instances where they show up. I also don't think the characters ever had tugs in the web series, so hey? I also like how the hair moves now when the characters do. It's the most obvious with Vendetta. Her little pigtails wobbles as she walks. It's a small thing, but it honestly goes a long way to making these characters feel alive. There are also more dynamic angles than in the web series. And look at the land of cheese! This is literally just a dream sequence in a short. It's not connected to anything, but they made it look so good. All the backgrounds have honestly gotten a heavy upgrade. I mean, first of all, there's an entire town now. We never got this in the web series. In fact, the only reason I know that it was the entire town that Charlotte destroyed and not just the school was because Charlotte and Vendetta's houses ended up coming after them too. <laughs> Those being the only other two locations that we ever got to see outside the school. Um, I mean, other than the pier, I guess. But here, we get city streets, and a library, and a restaurant, and shops, and other characters' houses. And it all looks really, really good. Winfrey couldn't do much with the backgrounds of the web series due to having to keep the bandwidth low. In fact, she literally just used the same texture over and over again in the web series to keep the file small. But now that she had a whole TV budget, she was able to be more experimental, turning photographs of mundane objects into background textures, with Cinciarini specifically being credited as one of the artists who worked on this. And it definitely shows. Everything is nicely detailed and layered and colorful. I didn't really notice until now, but Charlotte's roof is meant to look like her hair. And it's way more obvious in the TV show. And Vendetta's house has her little pigtails on the roof. The smaller bit of her house has Grudge's ears. And the garage where the kitty sleeps has little cat ears. Which is an absolutely adorable detail. And this carries over to the few of her homes that we get to see. Marriott's house is made to resemble her buds. And Mr. Milk's house just looks like a carton of milk. On top of new locations, we also got some new characters. First of all, we have Mort, who was actually in the web series, but he literally just showed up for a few seconds in concrete shoes to be terrorized by the ice cream feed. They decided to put him into Charlotte and Vendetta's class for some reason. I like how they literally could have just put him into the empty seat, but no, they straight up added a new table for him. They really wanted to give off the impression that this classroom is empty. Vendetta definitely killed some children. There was also a lot more adults than we had before. We got this mob, this bank manager. <coughs> There's an onion salesman that Vendetta likes to go to now. Enjoy raw and pickled onions at Clamberg's only onion stand. And he's one of the background kids' relatives. They added family members to a lot of the characters like Charlotte's grandmother. We knew that she had family in the web series. How about your family? Do they have their limbs? Huh? Oh, my family's fine. Thanks for asking. But now Charlotte's family is an actual character. This is Grandma Charlene. She's basically just an adult Charlotte. Such a sweet young girl. She's in a book club with Mrs. Minty, who isn't actually the kid's substitute teacher anymore. She's just kind of someone who exists now. And also, Vendetta's family is introduced in the TV show. There was absolutely no trace of her having a family at all in the web series. And honestly, the reveal of Vendetta's parents in the TV show is super dramatic. It feels like it's specifically intended for fans of the web series who might have been wondering about it for the past five years. <gasps> I like how this isn't explained at all, but also the episode right before this one was Shrinking Charlotte, where she shrinks Charlotte. So I mean, also it looks like she's keeping them in a hamster cage. 
Maybe she already had it from when she made her pet hamster really big? Another point in the grudge is Vendetta's pet theory. I like how her parents aren't even scared of her. Every time you see them in their cage, they're knitting and reading the paper and not concerned at all for what Vendetta is doing. They even seem to find it funny that Vendetta comes home every day screaming that she wants to kill Charlotte. Vendetta speaks of you very often. Ugh, oh, and very loudly. I guess all this implies that she was raised by parents who just kind of let her do whatever she wanted and didn't try to stop her when she started going down a dark path. I have not seen that stupid blue girl all week. My fiends most certainly have destroyed her. That is wonderful, darling. We know that Vendetta likes control and power, so it would make sense for her to be rid of her parents. But she decided not to kill them. She just turned them into her pets. So now they're reliant on her instead of the other way around. The episode Marvin the Middle Manager actually expands on Vendetta and her need for power. So if you remember in Wintry Day that like Vendetta is so offended that everyone's having fun when she's not at school that she has to go out of her way to punish them. Well, this episode builds on that. Vendetta realizes, hey, why am I still coming to school every day when I'm literally the one in charge here and I hate school? No, what I am doing here? I am super powerful and I am at school. But she doesn't want to leave the school unsupervised. So she puts one of the background kids, named Marvin, in charge as a middle manager to keep everyone terrorized while she stays home. However, Vendetta is unable to relax because she's too worried about people at the school not being miserable while she's away. And her worst fears are seemingly confirmed when Charlotte calls her. Oh, Marvin, he's the best! Today has been lots of fun! What? Vendetta busts into the school and finds Marvin seemingly playing with Charlotte and has him dragged away to be punished while announcing that this is why she comes to school. Now I know why it is that I go to school. Nobody can do my job better than me. I kind of prefer the subtlety of Wintry Day, but it is cool to essentially see that episode from Vendetta's perspective, considering that she didn't show up in it at all. I wish Vendetta could be here. If only you were here. Another thing worth mentioning about Vendetta is that she tends to be punished more often in the TV show. And that's not to say that she wasn't punished in the web series. There's an entire episode of the web series where Vendetta is trapped in the kitty's stomach with Charlotte and is slowly driven insane. The darkness. The singing. The stupidity. I don't think I can hold on much longer. Then there's Shrinking Slug, where she ends the episode tiny. No! I want to be bigger! And the April Fool's Day episode, where she accidentally gets tied to a rocket and shot into space alongside Charlotte. Mama! Yes, this episode is in Bulgarian. It's also very funny. The diamond nane bitta. And of course, the web series ends with her being trapped with Charlotte on a boat for god knows how long. No! But more often than not, Vendetta's plan would just fail, and she would get angry, and that would be it. Sometimes she even got what she wanted. <laughs> now, though, her schemes almost always backfire on her. In Mama Vendetta, she gets mad at Charlotte for touching her statue, so she makes some exploding chicks to kill her. However, the chicks end up imprinting on Vendetta, and the whole episode is Vendetta trying to get rid of the chicks while avoiding certain death. No! No! What are you doing? And ends with her statue being destroyed. In No Singing, Vendetta no. ends up being attacked by the monster that she created to kill Charlotte, and Smash also has the feed that she made for Charlotte attack her. Uh -oh. But in this case, it ends up fusing her body with Charlotte and later on Grudge. This causes Vendetta to literally try and take her own life. Take me, fiend! I have had enough of this torment! In New Best Friend, she makes termite feeds to destroy Charlotte's house, but it destroys hers instead. And in Tornado, she tries to blow away Charlotte's house, but just ends up with Charlotte's house on top of hers. As a result of all this, we see Vendetta in distress way, way more than in the web series, running away screaming or hiding in her closet tormented by nightmares. Can I borrow a cup of Charlotte? Of Charlotte? Charlotte? 
<laughs> Vendetta had a nightmare about Charlotte in the web series too, but that was more of an annoyance dream. In the show, Vendetta is actually scared of Charlotte. Ma, stay away from me, stupid girl. The greatest example of this is the episode Puppies, Puppies, Puppies. In this episode, Vendetta is so fed up with Charlotte annoying her everywhere that she goes that C invents a machine to duplicate a bunch of guard dog fiends to kill Charlotte. However, Charlotte being Charlotte befriends one of the guard dogs immediately. Charlotte feels bad that she can't properly take care of all the guard dogs, so she duplicates herself way more than necessary. She makes dozens, if not hundreds, of copies of herself. The Charlotte copies literally kidnap Vendetta and try to shove her into a cannon, causing Vendetta to faint from fear. Or shock. Or some combination of the two. Look, she's sleeping. Maybe shooting her out of the cannon will wake her up. We pretty much see this all from Vendetta's perspective. The copies are portrayed as being creepy. They talk in rhyme. Come on from behind those mugs. Lots more shirts, needs lots more hugs. And look at this frame. Not only is it shown from a slightly downward angle so it looks like they're staring down at you, but their smiles were elongated slightly to make them look more creepy. For comparison, there's a Charlotte in the background who's doing the normal Charlotte smile, and it does not go as close to the sides of her face as these copies do. Grudge ends up busting in and saving Vendetta, and they come up with a scheme to kill all the copies. Free gun drops for stupid girls! That's us! So, congrats to Vendetta for finally killing Charlotte. A hundred times. Hey! Unfortunately, one Charlotte gets away. Whether or not it's the original Charlotte, we don't know. Original Charlotte might be dead now, but at least we're back to the status quo. But then it's revealed that, no, there are still other copies hanging around. And it's like a horror reveal. <laughs> Charlotte is definitely more in this series. The Starlet in the web series is loud and cheerful, but she's mostly just kind of ditzy and unaware of her surroundings. Most of the time, she doesn't even do anything that warrants any kind of punishment. I mean, going through the webisodes here, Vendetta decides to kill Charlotte because she was singing while swinging, because she asked Vendetta if she wanted to play, for reminding Vendetta that her birthday is coming up, for giving Vendetta a valentine, for giving her a card. Okay, yeah, maybe she crosses a line or two. Reminding someone that your birthday is coming up every single day for a week. Vendetta, my birthday is only a week away. My birthday is in six days. My birthday is in five days. My birthday is in four more days. Is super annoying. And it is weird to dress up as someone in your class for Halloween without their permission, even if it was for a very sweet reason. Why not? You're my favorite person. But by and large, Vendetta is just kind of a hater. I mean, she doesn't have to be standing there watching Charlotte go down the slide. But she does. She stands there and she lets herself get mad, and then she decides it's Charlotte's fault. Vendetta is just so enraged by the idea that anyone would ever be happy in her town that she's made it her life's mission to punish this person who's really just minding her own business. And this isn't to say that Vendetta in the TV show isn't a hater. She notices Charlotte daydreaming about going to the moon and is so angry that she's just sitting there quietly that she makes up a whole song about Charlotte dying. The moon is full of dust, the moon does not have air. If you fell in a crater, nobody would care. But there are also now many instances where Vendetta's hatred for Charlotte is more warranted. Wow, your kitchen is a mess. Here, let me clean this up for you. No! Ah! Let's compare an episode that got redone for TV. The episode where Vendetta gave Charlotte the scissors feed. In the webisode, Charlotte asks Vendetta if she wants to play. She throws out a few ideas of things that they could do, Vendetta says no, and Charlotte just accepts it. Yes, 
Stupid little... Oh well, I guess I'll play by myself then, since all my friends are busy. Compare that to the TV show, where Charlotte does not take no for an answer. You stupid little... How about flamingos? Or soda jerks? She breaks out into song, Vendetta tells her to play dead to get rid of her. Why don't you pretend to be dead? Okay. Charlotte then proceeds to follow Vendetta around town, pretending to be a ghost, including breaking into her house. What are you doing up here? I'd return to the world of the living. This is the second episode of the TV series. Charlotte entered Vendetta's house without permission a few times in the web series, but it was pretty far and in between. And when Vendetta told her to leave, she did. Go away! Leave! Leave now! Okay. Not only is Charlotte constantly breaking into her house in the TV show, she pretty much always has to be thrown out. Out! Go away and leave me alone! It seems to be pretty much just accepted by the fans of the series that Charlotte has a crush on Vendetta, and that's why she's so obsessed with her. And you know what? I totally see it. Vendetta! That's a pretty name. She's so mysterious, but nice. Your statue is so pretty, Vendetta. What? And it's so, so fun to swing from your pretty, pretty elbow. Pretty, 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 Vendetti, ditty, ditty. Hello, I am a paper mache Vendetta head. I am pretty. Since you're already the mommy, I'll be the daddy. Like, look at her body language when she's talking to her. She has it bad. I can't even blame her. I've made my taste in women abundantly clear on this channel. Oh! oh, oh yes! Out. I'd probably be just as obsessed as Charlotte if I was in her shoes. And honestly, after a certain point, I totally get why Charlotte thinks that Vendetta is her friend. Vendetta is constantly cheering up Charlotte and giving her gifts and pets and bringing her parents back for a visit. I sure am glad I got to visit with you for a little while. And I have Vendetta to thank for it. And granted, she only does these things to kill Charlotte. But if you're as naive as Charlotte is, I would understand why you'd see these things as nice gestures and honestly want to hang out with the person doing them for you. On the other hand, though, Charlotte in the TV series comes off as being extremely rude. She knocks Vendetta into a pile of cans. <laughs> Completely by accident, but she doesn't apologize or help her up. She hits her with a toy train. You got hit by a train! <laughs> she knocks food out of her hand. And once was definitely on purpose. Rips magazines out of Vendetta's hands while she's reading them. One time even turning it into a hat. Destroys all the magazines in the library to make it into a craft. And then, of course, there's all the times where she breaks into Vendetta's house. I like that when Vendetta breaks into Charlotte's house, Charlotte doesn't see anything wrong with it. Leave me alone! I'm busy! Okay. Because it's literally just normal to her. This version of Charlotte kind of reminds me of what happened to Spongebob post-movie. And granted, I stopped watching around season 7, so I can't really speak as to how Spongebob is characterized now. But I personally witnessed Spongebob and Squidward's relationship go from Spongebob generally minding his own business and Squidward being annoyed and jealous of him to Spongebob literally being a creepy stalker who is now in love with Squidward and is constantly ruining his life. You sneak into my house every morning! Huh? <laughs> it's our favorite pastime! So, yeah, a grumpy introvert who wants to be left alone being followed by a loud and cheerful extrovert who doesn't respect their boundaries. I personally don't like the uh, Squidward torture episodes, as they're called in the Spongebob fandom, because it's very rare that Squidward actually deserves the torment he receives. For example, in the season 4 episode Good Neighbors, Squidward just wants to enjoy his Sunday off, and is tormented by Spongebob and Patrick so much that he loses everything, including his day off to pay for the destruction of our town. You'll be doing community service every Sunday for the rest of your life. Making feeds is actually better for this because 
Yes, Vendetta doesn't necessarily do something worth being punished in every episode, but Vendetta comes with the prerequisite that she is literally an evil villain. While Squidward is just a minimum wage fast food worker who hates his life, Vendetta has already destroyed and imprisoned the entire town before the series started. She's often seen laughing at the suffering of others. Oh my! Ah. <laughs> and is probably a mass murderer. We know that she killed this one guy, at least. Stop it! Stop me! Ah! So she absolutely deserves to be the one in terror for once, the one who doesn't feel safe in her own home, who has to be hyper aware of danger as she walks down the street. Charlotte is like a divine punishment for Vendetta. She's been sent to finally give her a taste of her own medicine. However, as discussed before, Charlotte doesn't just cause pain to Vendetta. She hurts pretty much everyone in the town at different points. One of the times she broke into Vendetta's house, she took Vendetta's parents with her. And while they willingly hang out with her for the afternoon, she doesn't let them leave. But we really should be- <laughs> It is time for us to- And then very nearly kills them multiple times in an attempt to play with them, treating them like how I used to treat my Barbies when I was eight. Oops! She steals Marvin's phone at one point, which causes it to get destroyed. Here you go! And basically leads him to getting punished by Vendetta. She also steals Marion's drill, and basically snitches her out to Vendetta that she was trying to escape. This hole in the floor looks like it could take you all the way to Canada! No! She literally pushes Marion to the point that Marion wants to kill Charlotte. What to eat Charlotte? She'll, she'll never stick her nose into other people's business ever again! And then the episode ends with Charlotte continuing to torture and snitch out Marion. She even destroys the town at one point like in the web series. However, in the web series, she was supposedly self-aware enough to realize what she had done and had gone around and rescued everyone. Whereas in the TV show, she's just riding her giant pony around, destroying people's homes and businesses. Whoops! No! No! She even ties up the giant kitty, completely unaware of its discomfort, despite trying to take good care of it in the web series. It gets so bad that the townspeople literally go to Vendetta for help. The person who took over the town and tortures them every day. They're less scared of her than they are of Charlotte. They even feel safer hiding in her house full of monsters than they do going anywhere near Charlotte. It's really not that surprising that a common interpretation of Charlotte is that she's a villain and that she is just as, if not more, evil than Vendetta. There was an episode early on in the TV series where Charlotte fills out a magazine quiz that tells her that she's more evil than Vendetta. I scored super evil! Yippee! In the end, it just turns out that Charlotte used the quiz to make a pretty picture, but you could still argue that her getting the highest score could be foreshadowing something. But you did score higher than me on the quiz. Also, she makes a feed in the episode. It's a very nice, snuggly feed. I love you! But still, we've never seen anyone other than Vendetta make a fiend before. Yeah, she's using Vendetta's ingredients, but Vendetta didn't help her at all. I'm going to- No! Don't tell me! I want to be surprised! Let me know when you are done! Even going back to the web series, Charlotte spends an episode talking about an imaginary friend that she has. Oh, like Carl! He's invisible too sometimes! Oh, Vendetta! I'm so glad you have an imaginary friend too! But then at the end, it turns out that Charlotte's imaginary friend was real? And... He looks like a feed! Did Charlotte make a feed? And even if that's not the case, Charlotte does have a bond with the feeds that no one else, not even Vendetta, has. In the web series, for example, when Charlotte and Vendetta are eaten by the giant kitty, Charlotte knows about the exit door, and Vendetta doesn't. I'll just use the exit. The exit? Sure, I 
I found it when I first got eaten by the giant kitty. Charlotte seems to have much better relationships with the fiends than she does her own pet. In fact, Charlotte treats her hamster, Buttons, like a toy in the same way she treated Vendetta's parents. And Buttons seems genuinely terrified of her. But Buttons too, aka the little scissors fiend, seems chill and comfortable with Charlotte. This is illustrated very clearly in this one scene in the Land of Cheese. Good night, Buttons. Good night, Buttons too. Charlotte is also the only one that we see taming the fiends. She is also able to interpret the note that Vendetta left Marvin on how to properly take care of the fiends. And she can very, very easily defeat the fiends. Even Vendetta has to make another fiend to defeat a fiend, but Charlotte takes them out with literally no effort. I tried to make a fiend, but she grabbed the ball and ate it. <laughs> <sighs> Some people take this theory to the extent that Charlotte is actively plotting against Vendetta and she's only pretending to be dub. And I mean, yeah, maybe. But the problem is that we see Charlotte before she even knows that Vendetta exists. And she acts the exact same. Wow! We didn't have giant cats in my old school. There's no personality shift from before her first day of school and after. We also see her playing alone and writing in her journal, and again, she acts the same. I really do think that Charlotte is genuine. I'd even go as far as to call her pure of heart. She always seems to have the best of intentions, no matter what she does, and in fact, in the episode Toupee, her role is to literally be an innocent. She gives Mr. Milk a gift out of the kindness of her own heart. Here's a present for the greatest teacher in the whole world! And this ends up being the reason why he spares her life. So, I don't think she's evil. Her problem is more that she's constantly lost in her own head and never takes a moment to consider the feelings of anyone around her. A really fascinating little moment between Vendetta and Charlotte occurs in Smash. Charlotte accidentally manages to save them from a fiend, and Vendetta seems to actually appreciate her for it. Oh, you destroyed my fiend! This is the only time that Vendetta genuinely seems to like Charlotte. And Charlotte doesn't even notice. Oh well. Hey, it's time for the Pancake Festival! She's instead disappointed that the feed is gone, and then drags Vendetta into a parade that she doesn't want to be in. Is it over yet? Please! I beg! Let it be over. I think this is an important little moment because it shows why Charlotte and Vendetta, as they are at this point, could never really be friends. Because Charlotte is too disconnected from reality that she's just genuinely incapable of making a real connection. I mean, if she really wanted to be friends with Vendetta, she probably could be if she put in the effort. Vendetta was super into hanging out with Charlotte when she thought that Charlotte was evil like she was. She even respected her during this time and wanted to learn from her. You must show me more of your super evil! But Charlotte is too in her own head to actually care about how Vendetta thinks or feels. Vendetta likes quiet. She likes alone time. She hates physical affection. She has weird interests and doesn't like girly things. And Charlotte not only refuses to respect even one of those traits, she doesn't even seem to realize that they're there. The version of Vendetta that exists in Charlotte's head is so far removed from the real Vendetta that they might as well be completely different people. Sharing is fun! Woo! Why don't we sing a song? I know! Let us sing about cheese! This is highlighted in the short Dear Pretty Diary, Dear Stupid Journal. In it, we see an average day from the perspectives of Charlotte and Vendetta. And Vendetta, despite being a mass murderer, is a much more reliable narrator than Charlotte. I don't believe Charlotte when she says that Vendetta invited her over and did her hair all nice because that's extremely out of character for Vendetta. But I do believe Vendetta when she says that Charlotte broke in while she was sleeping 
and then she hit Charlotte with a broom, and Charlotte liked it. <laughs> because Charlotte breaking in while Vendetta is sleeping is nothing new. <laughs> and she has also mistook acts of aggression as affection before. Ooh, thanks, Vendetta. And that's absolutely nuts when you think about it. That this apparently sweet and cheerful character's worldview is so messed up that we can't trust anything she says. But if it's not because she's evil, then what? Is she really that stupid? And I mean... Yeah... But also, there is an element to her character introduced in the TV series that might explain at least some parts of Charlotte Strange's personality. I feel like Pollyanna is pretty misunderstood within pop culture. Most people tend to remember her as a cheerful little girl who turns an entire town of miserable people happy with nothing but a positive attitude. But what people tend to forget is that this is a coping mechanism for her. It's literally described as a game that she plays whenever she gets sad. What is all this glad business you talk about? Oh, just a game I play. Helps sometimes. Helps what? When things aren't going so well. And it was invented for her by her now deceased father after they receive a pair of crutches in the mail instead of a doll. My father wrote to the missionary people and asked them to please send a little second-hand doll. When the missionary bells came, instead of a doll, they sent a pair of crutches. My father said, don't let's be gloomy, let's try and find something to be glad about. So we made a game of it, the glad game. At the beginning of the movie, Pollyanna's parents have died and she goes to live with her wealthy Aunt Polly who rules over the town with an iron fist. Aunt Polly literally shoves her recently orphaned niece into a tiny room in the attic so she doesn't have to be around her. Well, I'm not used to children's noises around the house, and that's the reason I chose that one. And bans her from talking about her dead father in the house. I don't want you constantly quoting what your father used to say. Do you understand? And honestly, a good chunk of the times Pollyanna is running around annoying people kind of comes off like she's desperately trying to find someone to talk about her dead parents with. I'm not supposed to talk about my father at home, but I guess it's alright here. The Glad Game is literally the only coping mechanism she has, and she does get really upset when it's belittled and put down. I just thought you could play the game! You could be glad you don't need this horrid old coffin! This is arguably the one time in the movie that we see Pollyanna's mask slip, and we see the sadness and anger at her situation come out. That and, of course, the end. Pollyanna loses the use of her legs. The Glad Game was invented after she accidentally received a pair of crutches, and she was able to be grateful that she didn't need them. Now she does need them, and the fact that the accident happened as a result of her aunt's neglect must really rub salt in the wound. And she finally decides to let herself be miserable for the first time in her life. No. It was a silly game. I hate it. I'll never want to play it again. However, the town shows up for her, and Pollyanna finally feels loved for the first time since her parents died. It is able to feel grateful without the glad game, all while knowing that the game that her father created has changed so many lives. So Pollyanna is not just a happy-go-lucky little girl. She's a hurt child who lost her parents and has been upended and sent to live in a town ruled by a tyrannical female who has placed herself in charge of the entire town. And, evidently, so is Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte showed no negative emotions at all in the web series. In fact, the first time Charlotte is ever shown to be upset about something is in the TV episode Parents, where, oh my god, Charlotte has dead parents. Well, okay, it's left pretty ambiguous if that's actually the case. Charlotte words it like they're dead. They're in a better place. Up there. But when Vendetta makes that obvious assumption, 
Charlotte corrects her? No, silly. They're living on a space station. But then Charlotte's grandmother comes over. Right. A space station. Just the way she says that line. They are totally dead. And the astronaut's thing is just to keep Charlotte from getting too upset. But she's still sad. She still misses them. You're so lucky. I wish my parents could be here. She has this book about a sad bunny looking for her parents. And yeah, that is Charlotte. That is a sad Charlotte bunny. Vendetta finds out about this. And like the kind, empathetic person that she is, makes two fiends to pretend to be Charlotte's parents so that they can eat her when her guard is down. No! Eat her! I like how it's self-aware of how messed up this is too. Do you not think this is my cruelest plan yet? Charlotte falls for it, of course, but the fiends end up liking Charlotte and truly adopt her as their own. Until they die in a completely unrelated accident. Grudge attempts to shoot Charlotte, but he misses. And the resulting trail smoke makes Charlotte think that they went back to space. Bye, Mommy! Bye, Daddy! I'm glad you came for a visit! This scene, right? Where Charlotte's pretend parents die in an accident, and Charlotte, without them ever saying goodbye or them ever telling her where they were going, just assumes that they've gone to space. This basically feels like what happened to her real parents. I don't want to say that this is confirmation, but this is confirmation. They are dead. And then the very next episode, we see Charlotte actually get depressed. Maggie, who is one of the background kids, reads a depressing poem about a dying kitten to the class, and it rocks Charlotte's entire world. But what happened to the kitty? Will it be okay? Probably not. Oh. I like how her bow gets all droopy. Um, it kind of reminds me of... <laughs> Meanwhile, Vedetta has created a fiend that attacks anything that sings. But for once, Charlotte isn't in the mood to sing. I only sing when I'm happy. Okay, then be happy. Now! <sighs> Vedetta tries to cheer Charlotte up to get her to sing, but she just ends up making her more upset. Eventually, Vendetta accidentally starts singing and the fiend goes after her, and Charlotte thinks of a way to save the kitty, and she's instantly in a good mood again. And, you know what? Maybe I'm reading too much into this. In fact, I definitely am. But combining the events of these two episodes made something very clear to me. And that is that Charlotte is literally repressing all the sadness in her life by making up whimsical explanations for every bad thing that happens. I mean, look at the way that Charlotte reacts to Maggie's poem. She's clearly stressed about the ambiguity and asks Maggie for assurance that there's a happy ending. But what happened to the kitty? Will it be okay? When Maggie denies her this... Probably not. Charlotte immediately spirals into a depression. Suddenly, she's faced with the reality that sometimes the world is cruel and innocent things die. And for once, she wasn't allowed to pretend otherwise. And the way that she gets herself out of this deep sadness is that Charlotte puts on this hat that Vendetta claimed helps you come up with new ideas. And this inspires Charlotte to make up a new ending where the cat lives. I can rescue kittens with monkeys wearing parachutes! It isn't an ending based on anything in the actual poem or even based on reality. It's a funny, whimsical ending that makes everything happy and sunshine and rainbows. Charlotte literally brushes away the very idea of death by just making something fun to cover it up. This is her glad game, her way of avoiding the truth of her depressing reality. In the episode New Best Friend, Vendetta notices how distressed Charlotte is when Vendetta kicks her out to stay with Marion and pretends to be best friends with Marion in order to hurt Charlotte's feelings. And oh boy, does it. Now, Vendetta pretty much tells Charlotte that she hates her and that they aren't friends and pretty much every episode. 
But we see in Dear Pretty Diary, Dear Stupid Journal, that Charlotte interprets every single action of Vendetta's as sweet and loving, and genuinely thinks that she's having as much fun as she is. She's never offended when Grudge kicks her out of Vendetta's house, because she just thinks that they're playing a game. Grudge is the best! He gave me a piggyback ride! But when Vendetta very pointedly kicks Charlotte out but doesn't kick out Marion, and hugs Marion but not Charlotte, it's really, really hard to interpret that in any other way. So, you're going to play with Marion instead of me? Charlotte's hurt, but she isn't completely shattered. She does try to win Vendetta back. Wanna play on this pretty tunnel drill I found in Marion's garage? But when Marion pelts her with her figurines, Charlotte reacts in pain and confusion. <laughs> Usually when Vendetta throws something at Charlotte, Charlotte interprets it as Vendetta giving her a gift. So this is new for her. And granted, it's Marion hitting Charlotte and not Vendetta, but it still goes to show that the veil Charlotte usually has to disguise her terrible reality is starting to slip. And at the very end of the episode, after Marion's house is destroyed and she goes to live with Charlotte for three weeks, Charlotte is right back to her old ship herself. She seemingly thinks that she's best friends with both Marion and Vendetta, and cheerfully decides to show Marion's drawing to Vendetta. Let's show it to Vendetta! Now that she's not being shut out and ignored, she's once again able to construct a narrative that she's friends with everyone, and everything is fun and wonderful, and completely ignore the fact that everyone hates her. Even the first introduction kind of works with this interpretation. Charlotte is thrown for a second when she first sees the kitty. I'm from Vermont. And seems shocked when it bats Malachi away. But then after a few seconds, quickly reverts back to her cheerful persona. Wow! We didn't have giant cats in my old school. And kind of the same thing happens when Vendetta tells her to pretend that they're not friends. Why don't you pretend that we are not friends? Okay. Hello, stranger. My name's Charlotte. Would you like to be friends? Now, obviously, I know I'm probably reading too much into this. Winfrey has made plenty of characters who are just meant to be stupid. Like, I doubt that the kids in Big Bunny are meant to have any kind of deep complexity. And the fact that Charlotte's grandmother has the same exact personality as Charlotte. Oh, goodness. Oh. Hello, Vendetta! How nice to see you! Does point to the idea that Charlotte is probably just kinda like this. But, I mean, it's interesting that they gave her these moments of lament, considering that she was nothing but puppies and rainbows in the web series. And it's honestly kind of important that they're there. A character like Charlotte could very easily become annoying or unlikable. But, I never feel like she does. These little moments of sadness keep Charlotte from being too one note. Whereas in the web series, you always know how she's going to respond to any given situation. You now genuinely don't know what her reaction's going to be. And it leaves you questioning how much she really does understand about her surroundings. And it's not as if Charlotte is the only character who gets a big shot of characterization. Because most of the minor characters get it too. Not... All of them, though, Mort gets absolutely nothing. Like, good for him, he got added to the classroom, but I don't think he has a single line. Malachi is a Puritan. He talks like one. Nay, I beg of thee, ask me not to eat thine cookie. I be too young to perish. And in the web series, he refuses to sing because it's blasphemous. I singeth not. Tis blasphemous. He serves as a kind of doomsayer for Charlotte, who always gets ignored. Tempt not yon fiend cat. Tis a minion of the pigtailed one. A fiend unholy. <laughs> He's a fun character entirely because of his speaking patterns, but he doesn't actually do anything. Maggie goes from being a background character who doesn't speak to being a snarky, depressed poet. She is the one who writes the poem that causes Charlotte to spiral into depression. Basically, the poem is about a kid who, for no apparent reason, gets stuck on a side. 
Despite the kitten crying out for help, no one comes to save it, and the poem ends with the kitten barely being able to hold on to the side while it continues to cry. The sun sets, the air is cold. No parka does it wear. The kitten, it is losing hold. And still, nobody cares. The poem presents an innocent becoming trapped and not being rescued. And within the context of the rest of the series, this seems to be about Maggie's despair of being trapped in the town by Vendetta, unable to escape, and no one caring enough to save her. The fact that the sign is spinning is an interesting detail too. The kitten isn't just sitting there waiting to die, it's in constant motion, constant danger. It's disoriented and dizzy with no way to stop it. Much like Maggie is constantly in danger from Vendetta and her fiends running around. And we see in Pony that she's actually somewhat desensitized to the danger and it barely affects her anymore. Oh no, a giant evil pony. <sighs> she also doesn't seem to like Charlotte and we could tell this by just a facial expression. It's called Tragedy of Hopelessness, number four. Yippee! This is fitting because her only line in the web series is this. Charlotte's dumb. I like Maggie. I wish she got an episode of her own like some of the other kids did. Like Marvin. But... Eh? Marvin is kind of a gimmick character in the web series, in that all of his lines start with the word my. My clouds, my pencil, my present, my god. This rule gets broken in Wintry Day because he's singing. Oh, winter a wonderful day. But other than that, they stick really, really hard to the gimmick. My sled won't work. There's even an entire episode where he's running for class president, and they write all of his dialogue to start with my. My, my, myself, my fellow classmates, my opponent, my plan, my, what an honor this is. They more or less drop this in the TV series, though. I mean, he still does it when he's in the background. Bye, banana. But the second he gets the spotlight, he talks normally. And that's how this banana saved my life. Which is honestly kind of disappointing. Although, to be fair, they did seem to try to shove the word my into as much of his dialogue as possible. How could I middle manage without my manual and my phone? In Marvin the Middle Manager, he's chosen by Vendetta to manage the school while she's away. He sucks pretty bad at controlling and maintaining the feeds, but ends up forming a friendship with Charlotte after she starts to help him. Despite him not doing any of the actual work, he still gets a big head and enjoys being in control, until he realizes that he has to kill Charlotte. <laughs> and is pretty disturbed that she's totally okay with it. I'll be a butterfly that gets hit by a piano! Uh, okay? He gives her a chance to back out. Are you sure you want to? Come but when she doesn't want to, fun. he follows her instructions on how to kill her. And it probably would have worked if Vendetta didn't bust in. It's kind of hard to gauge exactly how moral Marvin is here. He's totally fine with maiming his classmates. In fact, he seems pretty proud of it. But he's horrified by the prospect of killing Charlotte. Is it because he likes Charlotte? Is he not okay with murder at all? Or is he selfish and he knows that he's unable to be a good manager without Charlotte? We don't really know. The fact that he sings along with Charlotte to make her happy and puts on butterfly wings as per her last request. Come on, Marvin, sing along! Butter, butter, butterfly. Probably leads towards him caring about her at least a little bit, though. Though his last line in the episode is him grieving over the loss of his career. My career! Showing that he did like being in charge and doing all these cruel deeds. Marion in the web series could best be described as terrified. <laughs> Whenever she was on screen, she was scared, usually running away screaming. <laughs> 
This carries over to the TV series, until the episode New Best Friend, when it's revealed that she has been secretly digging an escape tunnel to Canada and is planning on fleeing that night. Her plans are foiled, however, when Vendetta busts in to announce that her house got destroyed and she's going to stay with Marion for a few days. And then Charlotte comes in and snitches Marion out. Look at this pretty picture of Vendetta! But why is there an ugly red line through her face? Vendetta ends up using Marion to make Charlotte jealous. We will do all the things you like to do. Only we will do them without you. Which is fitting because Charlotte was accidentally using Marion to make Vendetta jealous in the web series. I nominate Marion. What? But as it turns out, Marion is also extremely naive and starts to think that Vendetta is really her friend. To the point that she does a complete 180 and now absolutely adores Vendetta. I don't want to leave this town. Not ever. Ah, uh, okay. This time when Charlotte snitches out Marion, Marion is fearful of Vendetta not wanting to be her friend anymore and responds by pelting Charlotte with her prized glass figurines. Marion brought one that she really liked to show and tell in the web series, and in the TV show, she has a whole collection that she's really sad to leave behind when she escapes. I'll send for you after I cross the border into Canada. They are one of her favorite things in the whole world, and she willingly destroys them just to retain her friendship with Vendetta. Marion is so sick of Charlotte ruining things for her that she is actually the one who suggests creating a feed to destroy Charlotte. Charlotte's annoying. I think we should destroy her. So both Marion and Marvin are cool with being on Vendetta's side and actually seem to enjoy it to some extent, but Marion is the only one who is totally down for murder. Then again, Charlotte was on Marvin's side the entire time, whereas she was making Marion's life considerably harder. Maybe the real takeaway here is that Charlotte's obsessive stalking is bad enough to drive anyone to murder, even someone as sweet and timid as Marion. Either way though, Vendetta ditches her once her house is repaired, and even mocks Marion for being dumb enough to think that they were friends. You are stupider than stupid Charlotte! Marion is heartbroken, but decides to go to Canada after all, before the fiend that she and Vendetta made attacks her, destroying not just the escape tunnel, but her entire house. Marion is forced to live with Charlotte, who she now seems to very much dislike, and Charlotte, once again, runs off to snitch on her to Vendetta. What a pretty drawing of an escape submarine! <gasps> Let's show it to Vendetta! So the weird karmic powers that protect Charlotte from Vendetta are specifically punishing Marion now. No one messes with Charlotte, I guess. But the absolute holy grail of minor characters receiving characterization goes to Mr. Milk. The episode 2 pay focuses on him, and honestly, is one of the best episodes of the entire series. Mr. Milk is mostly characterized by his timidness. He's even too shy to say hi to his crush, Mrs. Minty, who has now been renamed to Miss Minty because she's single now, I guess. Charlotte cheers him up by giving him an apple. I've never had a student give me an apple before. Vendetta takes notice of this and gives him a present of her own the following day. It's a toupee that's extremely suave and charismatic. Hey there, handsome. It's your lucky day. And is able to get Mr. Milk invited to Miss Minty's book club. Don't you look enchanting today. Why my buttered stars? Mr. Milk? Mr. Milk is amazed by this and the toupee starts promising to make all of Mr. Milk's dreams come true. What do you want more than anything else? I... I've always wanted to work at a bank. I can help you with that! Which leads to pretty much the best song in the show. Might I be a Swiss banker? Mr. Milk is so quiet and timid, but every time he sings, it's so good. Enjoy the pretty alpine view. Find a chalet built for two. Mr. Milk is completely sold. 
until the toupee tells him the catch. Destroy Charlotte! So, yeah, we got Little Shop of Horrors in this kid so. How am I supposed to keep on feeding you? Kill people? I make it worth your while. What? Mr. Milk isn't sure that he really wants to kill Charlotte. He considers it, though. He considers it a lot. He literally follows this small child around for a full day, just trying to work up the courage to murder her. In the end, though, his morals went out, and he, quite literally, throws his dreams off a cliff. But now he's back to square one. He's still too nervous to talk to Miss Minty, which she interprets as disinterest and leaves him. The only bit of comfort he has is the apple that Charlotte gave him the previous day. Vendetta might have gotten him a better gift, but only because she wanted something from him. Charlotte literally gave him this apple out of the goodness of her heart, the only nice thing that anyone's done for Mr. Milk in a long time. He smiles, showing that he doesn't regret his choice, before turning around and going back to his miserable life. I saw a comment or two while going through YouTube, confused why Mr. Milk didn't learn to be more confident by the end of the episode, and talk to Miss Minty himself. That's what most shows would do, after all. Give Mr. Milk a happy ending for doing the right thing. But there's something almost realistic about this ending. Your personality doesn't change because you did one brave thing. Building confidence is a long, painful road. I can kind of relate to Mr. Milk in this episode. I'm also stuck in a job that makes me extremely anxious, and I haven't worked up the courage to leave either. The job market is extremely terrible right now, y'all. Sometimes it's easy to get complacent in your own misery. But this was a huge step for Mr. Milk. He has always been portrayed as cowering and giving in to Vendetta's every demand, but not this time. This was the first time he ever said no to her, and Granted, he didn't say it to her face, but this is still the first time that she told him to do something, and he refused. Just this one time, he didn't let her boss him around or manipulate him. A few episodes later, in Shrinking Charlotte, after Vendetta is shrunken down and leaves the room, Mr. Milk muses, I could have trapped her, put her in a jar, but then what? This exact thing happens in the web series, too. I... I could have trapped her, put her in a jar, but... but then what? However, what doesn't happen in the web series is the scene where he does actually try to put her in the jar. It doesn't work out for him, of course. <sighs> but he does still make an attempt to enter tyranny. This is something the web show version of Mr. Milk would never do. He does capture the red bird fiend Vendetta has bullying him in a jar in Wintry Day after hearing that she isn't coming in, but the second that Charlotte mentions that Vendetta's returning, he is immediately back to being terrified again. So he has courage, but it's only when Vendetta isn't around. However, here, he's trying to capture her directly. And then in Pony, it's implied to be Mr. Milk's idea to ask Vendetta for help. What are we going to do? And then he does all the talking. He's literally quivering in fear while he does it. But that's still him directly asking Vendetta to do something for them. That's absolutely crazy when Mr. Milk's introductory scene literally has him not being able to teach his class because Vendetta won't let him. Well, well yes, it, it is time for recess. Uh, class dismissed. Now he's straight up asking her for a favor? We were wondering if you would like to help us? Again, it's entirely possible that I'm overthinking this, but it does almost kind of feel like there might be an arc being set up that Mr. Milk is growing less and less afraid of Vendetta and is more willing to stand up for himself and the rest of the town. Thank you for saving us, uh, Vendetta. The thing is, I don't know if this show was meant to be purely episodic, with all the character development being immediately erased at the beginning of each new episode, or if some things were meant to carry over. The web show was mostly episodic, 
but towards the end, there was an actual multi-episode storyline, and it almost feels like that's being set up to happen again. Grudge is continually shown to be mistreated in the TV show, such as in A Fiendy Friend when Vendetta only gets him a peanut to eat, and he's shown to be pretty sad about it. In Smash, he's shown to have fleas. Ah! Fleas! Something that might be chucked up to neglect, and Vendetta is constantly yelling at him and very pointedly does not appreciate his efforts. But he failed! Stupid hamster! In the episode Tornado, he is blown thousands and thousands of miles away and goes through absolute hell trying to get back. When he finally does, he literally solves all of Vendetta's problems within seconds and then runs in to rescue her, only for her to berate him for taking too long. Where have you been? Can you never do anything right? How dare you go have fun while I suffer? This doesn't just feel like a gag. Grudge gets a lot more screen time on his own in the TV series, and there's much more focus on his emotions and on his character. He actually seems to be kind of a softy, and he likes cute things and pink and physical affection, but he hides all of this from Vendetta because she needs him to be the tough guy. It's also very, very evident that he genuinely seems to care about Vendetta, despite her mistreatment of him. He puts his body in the line of fire over and over again just to keep her safe. Knowing where the web series goes, it really does feel like they're setting up for the Rubella storyline again. Or at least something similar, where Vendetta fires and replaces Grudge, but then realizes that she needs him, and comes around to actually appreciating him. And I mean, Janet the Giant Squid is shown at the end of Toupee. Hey there, handsome. It's your lucky day. And Vendetta's giant statue is the focus of the episode, Mama Vendetta. Charlotte loves the statue, and she loves dressing it up and painting it. And even though it gets destroyed at the end of the episode, it's shown to have been rebuilt in Pony. <laughs> so we got the planting, the reminder, and maybe the payoff was meant to be Charlotte painting it with the fiend dip and it coming to life? Maybe? But I also understand that Easter eggs are a thing, and there are a few in this series. Good thing I bought Kitty that extra, 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 extra large flea collar. Ooh, let's buy an extra large flea collar. These might not be setups for future events at all, and just little nods to the fans of the web series. But it's basically impossible to tell where the show is going because there isn't much show to go off of. There are only six full half-hour episodes containing either three episode segments, which are about seven minutes each, or two segments and a bunch of shorts. The first episode aired on October 4th, 2008, and the sixth episode aired on November 1st, 2008. Meaning that the show's original run didn't even last an entire month. And let me make one thing clear. Nickelodeon did legally get the rights to this property, and they could do anything they want with it. The fact that they cancelled the show isn't the problem. If they made a full season and they advertised it and tried really hard to make it successful, but it still underperformed, then it would be understandable that it wouldn't be worth continuing to make. Sometimes things just don't work out, and that's fine. The problem is that they didn't do any of that. First of all, the episodes. I know sometimes shows have really short first seasons. Parks and Recreation's first season was also only six episodes, and every single other season had triple that amount. And looking at just Nickelodeon, Drake and Josh's first season had six episodes, and Fairly Odd Parents' first season only had seven episodes, and the Fairly Odd Parents has been treated so well by Nickelodeon, it's gotten a bunch of movies, a spin-off, and way, way too many seasons. However, Making Fiends wasn't supposed to have a short first season. 
The official Making Fiends website is apparently run by Winfrey. It has a Q&A that was last updated a little less than a year after Making Fiends was cancelled. And one of the questions listed is, Are there seven additional half hours of Making Fiends television scripts written and just waiting around for Nickelodeon to decide that they would like to make more episodes? To which she replies, Yes. So, if this is to be believed, which I do believe it, because if anyone would know, it would definitely be Winfrey, the first season of Making Feeds was meant to have 13 half-hour episodes, and Nickelodeon straight-up refused to make over half of them. And the episodes they did make weren't treated very well either. Making Feeds was not aired on the main Nickelodeon channel, but on the Nicktoons channel, which is a channel that didn't come with a lot of cable packages. I actually had this channel for a little while growing up. I remember that Nickelodeon was channel 24 or 25, you know, something like that, and Nicktoons was something like channel 237. I don't even know how I found it. My sisters and I used to watch it a lot, though. There were some really weird, obscure cartoons there. The ones I remember the most were Kappa Mikey and The Secret Show. And I continue to be the only person who knows about the existence of The Secret Show. The Nicktoons Network, though, seems to be Nickelodeon's graveyard, where they send shows that they don't want anymore to die. It sent Welcome to the Wayne, and Bunsen is a Beast, and Season 10 of The Fairly Odd Parents. Even the Wikipedia says that the main purpose of the Nicktoons channel is to kill off cartoons. So, this was already a bad side, but Making Feeds received very, very little promotion and no press release. The new episodes, as far as I can find, seem to air consistently at 11.30 a.m. on Saturdays, which is wild. I recall all the shows I grew up with premiering in the evenings, with only shows meant for smaller children airing in the morning. At 11.30 on a Saturday is weird. I would imagine it would be a bit too late for parents to be letting their kids sit in front of the TV eating their breakfast. So yeah, Nickelodeon didn't give the show a fair shake. Not at all. They were actively trying to kill it. But why? Why go through the effort of buying this property just to leave it on a side channel to die? Now, of course, I can't say the exact reason. I wasn't there, I was not involved, but just from what I've personally seen, it's likely that the main reason that the show was buried and killed was that Nickelodeon just doesn't like making new shows. Nickelodeon will have its cash cow, and they'll put it front and center, and push everything off to the side to get as much profit as they can. And in this case, the cash cow was Spongebob. In fact, Spongebob has been the cash cow for several decades now, with the Loud House as a lesser cash cow just off to the side. Taking a look at Nickelodeon's current lineup for shows, they have three Spongebob shows either currently running or in production. And amazingly, this theory I have is heavily backed up by a very similar Nicktoon tragedy. Harvey Beaks was a Nickelodeon show that ran from 2015 to 2017. In November of 2016, Nickelodeon canceled the show, and they did not inform its creator, C.H. Greenblatt, of the cancellation. He found out from a tweet. Understandably upset, he took to his Tumblr and ranted about his mistreatment at Nickelodeon, which led to him being reprimanded and being forced to go onto Cartoon Brew to say he's not actually upset at the network. Harvey Beaks was then put onto Nicktoons to die for its last season. Now, the rants Greenblatt posted on Tumblr are gone, understandably, but Cartoon Brew did quote them in an article about the situation. So, according to Cartoon Brew, Greenblatt had said, Nick will have aired Harvey just barely 15 hours total for all of 2016. They run a lot more than 15 hours of Spongebob each week and expect us to compete with a global phenomenon show 18 years old. Honestly, if I ran a network that way, I would be ashamed and disgusted with myself. And while I don't want to speak for Winfrey, it does seem that she's come to the same conclusion. 
A few years ago, Nickelodeon decided to honor their creators by making little profiles on their website and hanging portraits up of them on their creator wall. Winfrey responded to this on her Twitter, which I guess I've been working on this video for so long, it's called X now. I'm not going to call it that. Winfrey responded to this on her Twitter, criticizing Nickelodeon for their treatment of her show, and then finishing off by saying, Love the painting, but I'd rather you gave new shows a chance. And then in a follow-up tweet, I don't regret my time at Nick. I felt loved and supported by the studio until they chose not to air it. I'm just sad to see in 2020 they still rely on old shows, some by problematic creators, instead of taking risks on new voices. And the thing is, you can see in interviews that Nickelodeon was apparently very supportive of Winfrey and making fiends throughout its production. From an interview with LA Weekly in 2008, few restrictions were made by the network execs when they made the deal. They told Winfrey, just don't mention Hitler and don't hit people on the head. But then again, we do hit people on the head, she says. So, and then 11 years later in an interview with Deadline, Winfrey said of the restrictions, but we certainly had different standards than other shows. When our standards and practices person went on vacation, someone else took over and they marked up our scripts like crazy. Then our regular person came back and was like, no, 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 it's, it's okay. You can hit children in the head on this show. <coughs> this is supported by C.H. Greenblatt and his now deleted Tumblr posts. As a studio, they have been creatively supportive. I've worked with amazing people. They let me make the show I wanted with little compromise. I couldn't have had a better experience. His rants on Tumblr specifically involved the way that the show was handled after it was made. That it was aired in such a way that it just could not compete with the network's cash cow Spongebob. And because it wasn't doing as well as Spongebob, the studio saw it as appropriate to just kill the show. In fact, while I was working on this, the CEO of Paramount, which owns Nickelodeon, literally said that they aren't going to put original animated movies in theaters anymore and only focus on popular franchises. We're not going to release an expensive original animated movie and just pray people will come, is the exact quote. And one of the IPs specifically said that they're going to be focusing on is Spongebob. So yeah, Apparently nothing has changed. So, from Winfrey and Greenblatt's accounts, it honestly seems like there were people at Nickelodeon who loved and believed in their properties. That they were very hands-on and eager to make these shows the best that they could be. But the higher-up executives, the ones at the head of Nickelodeon, or even higher up at Paramount, absolutely do not. They just see their shows as walking money bags. And unfortunately, they're the ones who decide if the show lives or dies. And in both these cases, they decided to kill their shows. On June 13th, 2008, the episode iCarly Saves TV premiered on Nickelodeon. The episode features the daughter of someone who works at a kid's TV network really liking a web show and the creators of that web show being approached about bringing their series to the network. Throughout the process, the creators are disrespected and in the end, the network just ends up going back to the old formula they're used to rather than trying out something new. Looking back on how Making Feeds and its creator was treated, this episode is honestly kind of infuriating. I don't anyone involved in its creation even knew what was going on with Making Feeds, although the network discovering the web show through an employee's daughter is a really weird coincidence. But still, it is really ironic that Nickelodeon would put out an episode making fun of networks for not understanding a web show's appeal and wanting to stick to their old formula instead of being experimental. All while currently being in the process of burying the web show that they turned into a TV series. But what's even worse is how the episode ends. Carly is told straight up that she signed a contract, so she can't just go back to making her show on the internet. We own the title iCarly now. 
And we own you. However, because the executive changed the show so much it didn't even have anything to do with iCarly anymore, she got the rights to her show back. And they're not even calling it iCarly anymore. Lucky for us. So you get the name back? Yeah. yeah. And the episode ends with them continuing on their web series on their own, like nothing even happened. And this is iCarly, back on the internet, where nobody can tell us what to do. But that's not what happens in real life, is it? Every situation is different, obviously, but usually once the contracts are signed, the corporations typically hold on to their newly found properties with such a death grip that the original creators will never get them back. And that's exactly what happened with making feeds. Nickelodeon wasn't going to make new episodes despite them being fully scripted. And Amy Winfrey wasn't allowed to go back to making them on her own. She signed away the name, the characters, everything. Making feeds wasn't hers anymore. It belonged to Nickelodeon. And Nickelodeon wanted it to die. So it did. Making Feeds was a series that Winfrey created after she lost the rights to Big Bunny. She wanted a series she could run independently for as long as possible, and she brought in her friends to work on it with her. Her husband, people she went to school with and worked professionally with. And it was successful. So successful it was literally paying her bills. As stated on the Making Feeds website, as the series took shape and drew more and more fans, Amy began selling t-shirts and DVDs in her online gift shop. Sales were good enough that Amy could make a happy living from her little cartoon. So Nickelodeon didn't just take a cartoon from Winfrey, they literally took her livelihood. And they approached her. Winfrey didn't send in a pilot. It was Nick's idea to turn this into a show in the first place. And for what? Legally speaking, it's their show and they can do what they want with it. But from a moral and artistic perspective, they stole this woman's baby. And unfortunately, selling your property is really the only way to get on TV. This sentiment was shared by SpongeBob creator Steven Hillenberg in a 2002 LA Times article, which was about when season 3 of SpongeBob was airing. At the time, Hillenberg, though interested in a possible SpongeBob movie, just wanted to end the show. And then the way this article ends is so sad and eerie 20 years later. But Nickelodeon could do anything it wants. The studio owns all rights to the show and to franchises for Spongebob merchandise. Hillenberg sold his rights to get his concept made, he said. You could never get anything made if you didn't sell ownership to the people who are spending the money to make it, he said. Nickelodeon could continue to produce new episodes without the show's creator being involved, as happened years ago with the channel's Red and Stimpy series. But he doesn't think that Nickelodeon would. I think they respect that my contribution is important, Hillenberg said. I think they would want to maintain the original concept and quality. Since this article was written, Spongebob has had 13 seasons, 2 spin-offs, and 3 movies. In fact, not only did Nickelodeon continue after Hillenberg left the show, the show outlived Hillenberg. He passed away in 2018 and yet, New episodes continue to be made. Not only that, but Nickelodeon infamously announced that they were going to make Spongebob spinoffs right after Hillenberg's death. Hillenberg had apparently always been extremely adamant about Spongebob never having any spinoffs, and it appeared that they had waited for him to literally die in order to make them. Paul Tibbet who worked closely with Hillenberg and took over as showrunner after he left, was infuriated by this and went to Twitter to express his anger. I do not mean any disrespect to my colleagues who are working on this show. They are good people and talented artists. But this is some greedy, lazy executive thing right here. And they all know full well Steve would have hated this. Shame on them. I'm not going to argue that the newer seasons of Spongebob are necessarily bad. And also, I know that Steven Hillenburg came back for a little while before his death, and I can't speak to the quality of the episodes that he worked on, but it's unfortunately very clear that Hillenburg was wrong that Nickelodeon cared about his vision for the show 
and wanted it to be the best quality that it could be. So wrong, in fact, that they used his death to make more money and drag the show out longer. Nickelodeon has never cared about their creators, even when the creators' ideas have literally made the billions. In fact, do you remember those profiles from earlier? I know at first glance, it's like, Aw, they're honoring their creators, that's so nice. But a lot of these profiles don't even mention what shows they created. Granted, the profiles do show up at the bottom of the pages of their respective shows, but if you're actually on the creator's page, you would have no idea who made what. Billy Lopez, Eric Robles, I had to Google what shows they made. Despite there being free creators of The Mighty Bee, they don't say anything about Cynthia True in the blurb, and pretty much only talk about Amy Poehler. I guess because she's the most famous one, and then they somehow manage to misquote her. They put the quote twice, which is not what she said. Winfrey's profile is honestly kind of funny, because much like many of the other creators, they do not mention the show that she created, but they do list all the web series that she's made on her own, but somehow they don't mention making feeds. These profiles also don't exist on the actual Nick website that kids would go to to look up their favorite shows. It's only on NickAnimation.com, which seems to be dedicated to showing off how cool their products are and recruiting new animators. And I was like, wait a second. Are these profiles here just to convince people to work at Nickelodeon? And as it turns out, yes. I stumbled across this dude, Abe Levin, who got hired to work on the site, and he says, What better way to inspire future creators than to see current idolized ones in action? So, yeah, these profiles and portraits weren't done out of respect and appreciation for the talent that actually supplies Nickelodeon with their programming. No, they're just using them as a hiring gimmick. Even decades after some of these people left the network, or, you know, straight up died, Nickelodeon is still using them to squeeze out every penny they can. I recently watched the show Moral Oral. And oh my god, it's so good, guys. It's so good. I'm gonna get demonetized for this part. Uh, okay, so content warning, just a heads up. It aired on Adult Swim from 2005 to 2008, and the first season is just straight-up comedy. Nothing is taken seriously, there's a horrible disaster in, like, every episode, and every time it just resets. However, as the series went on, there were hints of a darker toad hiding under the surface which all culminated in the season 2 finale, which was extremely intense and barely had any jokes in it at all. Adult Swim apparently loved this tonal shift, and the creator took this as a sign that they should go darker with the third season. And they did. The third season takes its story and characters very, very seriously taking its time meticulously building up and adding depth to all of their characters. Not just the main ones, but even the ones who, up to this point, have only existed in the background. And Adult Swim hated it. They thought the show was too dark now. Allegedly, the breaking point was the episode alone, which showed three background characters dealing with trauma, two of them having been assaulted. And it's played dead straight. There's some gags in the radio broadcast and the newspaper, but everything related to these women's pain and trauma is taken very, very seriously. Not with you, you're different! This is actually one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen, and Adult Swim seemed to agree, but ultimately decided it was too dark for their network, and, well, RIP Moral Oral. What's absolutely wild, though, is that Alone wasn't the first time that Moral Oral has had an episode about assault. The second episode of the entire show, called God Chef, has Oral, um, um, ugh. So have you guys ever seen Don't Breathe? Actually, no, hey guys. <laughs> Bad, we're not gonna talk about that. Uh, so Oral 
takes a frosting bag, right? And, uh, everyone's pregnant now. You can fill in the blanks. And Adult Swim was totally cool with this episode. Granted, they did request that one scene be removed. But otherwise, they let it air. They didn't cancel the show over it. The main difference between God, Chef, and Alone is that God, Chef is played for comedy. So Adult Swim is cool with assault being used for comedy, but not when its victims and their feelings are taken seriously. Originally, the show was supposed to get around five seasons, and they were now cut down to three. Not only that, but they even reduced the amount of episodes in the season from 20 to 13, meaning that there were seven unproduced scripts, just like making feeds. The crew of Moral Oral were deeply unsatisfied with their show being cut down prematurely. I always thought it was passive aggressive to put the season episode number in the opening of season three. None of the other seasons had that. And after the show officially ended, the crew came together to create one more episode. See, at the point that the show was canceled, an episode called Abstinence had already been recorded. And while Adult Swim wasn't going to animate and air the episode, some crew members, namely David Tuber and Mick Ignis, came together to animate the episode for free. It premiered at the 2009 San Francisco Sketch Fest and was considered lost media until David Tuber uploaded to YouTube in 2015. It was copyright struck, of course, but another YouTuber whose name I cannot pronounce re-uploaded it sometime later. I think this alone really goes to show how much this show was a labor of love and how much everyone working on it really believed in it. This was a lot of work to do for free, and now because of them, we get one more Moral Oral episode that wasn't meant to exist. Similarly, Amy Winfrey did go on to make more making feeds. Kinda. She obviously couldn't make more of the actual web show, but satire parody law does exist. You are allowed to use copyrighted characters if you're poking fun at them. In 2012, Winfrey created Making Friends, which has Vendetta and Charlotte, which switched personalities. This episode is genuinely super funny to me entirely because they still have their same voices. <laughs> like the cheerful way Charlotte tells Vendetta to leave her alone sends me every time. No, go away! Three years later, in 2015, Winfrey created Baking Beads, which is basically just a short episode of Baking Feeds, except that the characters are beads. This one is cute, but honestly, it kind of makes me sad. Through a series of fun and improbable events, the beans got canned! This is tragic. If Winfrey wants to make episodes of the show that she created, she has to do parodies of it. Like, that's honestly a huge bummer. It kind of reminds me of how the original offer of The Vampire Diaries, L.J. Smith, was booted out of her own series and replaced with a ghostwriter, and she ended up continuing the books years later by writing fan fiction on Amazon Kindle. Like, it's great that she was able to find a way to keep working on the series she loved so much, but isn't it also kind of ghoulishly wrong that someone has to find all these legal loopholes in order to keep making their art? People always say capitalism breeds innovation, but there are countless examples of corporations crushing projects and keeping artists from their works. Works that they would otherwise love to work on, just because it makes a few people at the top a few more dollars. One of the most infamous recent examples is that there's an entire Batgirl movie so deep into pre-production that it was being shown to test audiences that will never be released. As well as a Scooby-Doo animated feature called Scoob Holiday Haunt that was also scrapped. While the initial scrapping of Batgirl was originally said to be because it wasn't up to the quality of their other DC movies, the narrative pretty quickly turned into, no, actually, they're writing this off as a loss of their taxes. As explained by Deadline, 
Warner Brothers Discovery took advantage of a purchase accounting maneuver available to the Conglum because the company changed hands. That opportunity expires in mid-August and allows WBD to not have to carry the losses on its books at a time when the studio is trying to find free billion in cost saving synergies. This particular film costing around 70 million, it's interesting that the scrapping of Batgirl gets announced before Warner Brothers Discovery's big quarterly earnings call tomorrow. So, it was all a scheme to try and recoup their losses after Warner Brothers and Discovery merged. And as a result, a movie that hundreds of people worked on becomes lost media. Before it even had a chance to become media. The directors have even spoken out about how devastated they are that their work, as well as the work of everyone involved, will never be seen. Just a few months ago, another Scooby-Doo movie was revealed to have been scrapped. Scooby-Doo and Crypto 2, and the entire thing leaked online. So it just seems that Warner Brothers are making movies and not releasing them. Like that is their actual business model now. Another victim of the Warner Brothers Discovery merger was popular animated show Tuca and Birdie, which is unfortunate because it had already been canned by Netflix previously. In fact, despite its critical acclaim, Netflix canceled it after only three months. Netflix is pretty notorious for canceling much-beloved shows after only one or two seasons. And while Netflix is pretty tight-lipped, it's been speculated that they cut down on their shows after two seasons because show creators typically get more money the longer a show goes on. Harrington says that shows on Netflix are more expensive after season two and even more expensive after season three, with the premiums going up each season. They have to give a show more money per series, and if they decide to recommission it, it becomes more expensive for them to make, he explains. Because of that, so many more shows are cancelled after two series because it costs them more. The rule right now is that Netflix measures how worth it is keeping a show going based on how they do in the first 28 days. And if you want a show to get another season, you have to make sure you watch it a lot in the first month. And that's kind of asinine. Parks and Rec and the US version of The Office notoriously had really bad first seasons that no one liked. But the networks took a risk in giving them another season, and they ended up becoming really, really good. They are probably both some of the most beloved TV comedies of all time. That would have never happened in today's climate. They would have been canned in season one, and just remembered as failed sitcoms that nobody liked. How many shows can you really say that the first season is the best season? The first season is almost always kinda weird and rough because the writers and actors are still getting used to the material, or because the characters haven't had time to properly grow or be expanded on yet. You can't properly judge the quality of a work or how much cultural relevance it might end up having based on how people react over the course of a single month. Art is created from risks and no one wants to take risks anymore. Shows and movies are no longer seen as art, they're seen as products to pump out money, and if more money can be made by the piece of media being stopped and buried, then it will be stopped and buried, regardless of quality or any potential it might have ever had. There's something scary about this era of streaming services. So many things don't have physical releases anymore, so once they're taken off of Netflix, Hulu, Paramount Plus, they're just gone. In August of 2022, while merging with Discovery Plus, HBO Max purged a lot of programming from their streaming service. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. They decided that they didn't want anything that was unscripted or anything animated on their platform anymore. So dozens and dozens of shows were removed all at once. And they weren't going to sell physical copies, so all these shows were just gone. Art director Levin Jihanian, who worked on Tig and Seek, went on Twitter shortly after its removal and said, It's God. They're all God. Like, yeah, I could go on a pirate streaming website to watch episodes, but my kids can't. I made this for them. And of course, some people responded to him by pointing out that, like, he could just pirate the show and save it for his kids. But that 
really isn't the point. Most parents aren't going to pirate shows for their young kids. Not when there's thousands of easily accessible content on YouTube or any of the streaming services that they pay for. Once a kid's show is no longer easily accessible by kids, it's never going to be watched by its target audience. Making feeds is not on a streaming service. It was, at one point, available on DVD, but that is not the case anymore. The only reason that anyone is able to watch the show is because there is a community on YouTube dedicated to preserving it. Huge shout out to everyone I got the footage from. You're doing the world a great favor. But what would happen if Nick decided to take it all down? It would just be gone forever. The web series is still fortunately able to be watched. Winfrey must have gotten some of her rights back at some point. She uploaded the whole web series onto her YouTube channel, animated a new sequence for one of the songs from the web series, and she is now able to sell Making Feeds merch. Something she said in a 2007 interview she wouldn't be able to do if the show was picked up by Nickelodeon. She also eventually got the rights to Big Buddy back sometime around 2006-2007. So anything is possible, I guess. I don't know the terms of her agreement with Nickelodeon. I wanted to show her my support, so I bought this autographed print. It's hanging up above my autograph of Marguerite. And also, I would suggest checking out her gift shop, maybe giving her your support if you're able to. But I do want to stress that this didn't destroy her. I don't think it's fair on Winfrey to have her entire legacy boil down to being the lady who got screwed over by Nickelodeon. She has accomplished a lot since the cancellation of Making Feeds. She's made a few more web series, including Squid and Frog and Fun with Cobra, with the most recent being Hooray for Hell, about a blue girl who finds herself in hell and tries to make the best of it and which features a cameo from someone you might recognize. Dealing pastries? What? It's okay. I'm a professional. She made six more Muppet films to celebrate the 10-year anniversary, and two additional holiday ones some years later. She also made a pilot for Disney called Lucky Beast, which unfortunately didn't get picked up. She currently has a contract with Fox, and has been working on Velma, which, like, I know how people feel about that, uh, but literally, it's a job, so who cares? IMBD also claimed that Amy Winfrey is the co-creator of Tomorrow's Pioneers, which is that really infamous Palestinian children's show where Mickey Mouse is anti-Semitic and they encourage children to martyr themselves. The only evidence for her having anything to do with this show is IMBD. Nowhere else does it say that she was involved. IMBD also claims that Bill Nye was in the show as a Jewish man. And that's why you don't use IMDB as a source, kids! Most notably though, Winfrey and her husband Merriman both directed on BoJack Horseman. It's cute how often they've worked together during their careers. And actually, so did Martin Sandrata one of the directors of Making Feeds. Winfrey is the only director to have directed in all six seasons, and she's also directed the most episodes. And some of the ones that she's directed are considered the best episodes in the entire series. The Telescope, Escape from LA, Rufy, Free Churro, The New Client, The View from Halfway Down. The View from Halfway Down is such a good episode that there's a subsection of BoJack Horseman fans who wish it was the finale instead of the one that we actually got. Some of her episodes were even nominated for Emmys. And Winfrey was also a BoJack Horseman character. She and Merriman make a cameo in the episode Sunk Cost and all that. Yeah. What's the big idea? And this all came about because of Making Feeds. Winfrey talks in a Deadline interview that one of the directors who worked on Making Feeds recommended her to Netflix to be a director on BoJack's first season. So it's not as if turning Making Feeds into a TV show was a waste. It actively opened up opportunities for Winfrey and Merriman. Same thing with Ego Plum. Making Feeds was his first time composing for a cartoon, and he went on to work on many others. Star vs. the Forces of Evil, Harvey Beaks, pretty much all of the Spongebob shows, that's steady work. He's probably best known for composing the music for the Cuphead show, which 
might have not even happened if he never got his foot in the door with making feeds. So while it's tragic that Winfrey lost her creation, I don't think it's a bad thing that she sold it to Nickelodeon. The show that resulted from it was legitimately very good and opened up a lot of doors for her and the other people who worked on it. I just wish there was more of it. It had so much potential to be something great, and there's a sort of bitter sadness I feel watching it again all these years later. Imagining the alternate timeline where Nickelodeon actually gave this show a fair chance, where kids had making beans birthday parties, and had plushes of grudge and buttons too, where they would rush home from school because they wanted to watch the new episode, and you would walk into Hot Topic and see Charlotte and Vendetta t-shirts. How many kids would have loved to have grown up with this show, who never even knew it existed? Bojack Horseman was unfortunately one of those shows that was cut down too early by Netflix. Like Moral Oral, it was supposed to go on for a few more seasons before suddenly being cancelled, so it just suddenly has to wrap up. Princess Carolyn and Judah's romance is super, super rushed. It's very obvious it was meant to be fleshed out more. And Winfrey and Merriman also both directed on Tuca and Birdie, which I already talked about the pure turmoil that turned out to be. But I also think that's unfortunately the name of the game. I don't think there's a single person working in television today that hasn't been burned in some way. The current ongoing strikes have been a long time coming, and I hope they get everything they deserve for crafting the stories we all love so much. Artists are not a respected breed of people, despite how much we all rely on them for the media we consume. Winfrey is not alone in being disrespected, and it isn't fair that she is remembered only for what was taken from her, and not what she has created. And in the same vein, it sucks that Making Fiends is really only remembered for its premature cancellation. But since it only aired for one month, that's really the only thing that a lot of people can remember from it. But Making Fiends is so much more than just a sad tale of corporate greed. It's a passion project, created with so much love by someone who believed in it so much and brought on the closest people in her life to help her work on it. The visual style is unique, the songs all slap, and everyone got together to make them. This is such a finely crafted show made by people who loved it. It had such a small amount of time on this earth, but I'd rather remember it for the time that it had than for all the time that it lost. We shouldn't forget its fate. We should always remember what greedy networks will do just to get a few extra bucks. But we also shouldn't just boil art down to the corporate interests that surround it, and instead appreciate the love and care that brought it to us in the first place. And Making Feeds was a show that was absolutely brimming with it. And I'm glad I got to grow up with Making Feeds. Even if it was just for a little while. Alright, so uh, thank you very much to my top Patreon supporters, Katie, Louie, and Mooney. Uh, if you want your name up here, I am the Patreon. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Go give Amy Winfrey's gift shop a, a look. Um, I really like my print that I got, and I'm staring at it literally right now as I'm recording. Uh, it's keeping me company. Uh, Alright, bye everyone. Thank you for watching.